Mayor. I can't. I can't. Am I? Good evening. I want to call this meeting of the Durham City Council to order tonight at 7 o'clock on November the 18th, 2019. I certainly want to welcome everyone here today and also those people who are at home watching our meeting. We're very glad that you're with us. And I'll first ask if you will please join me in a moment of silent meditation. Thank you. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shule. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Councilmember Alston. Councilmember Caballero. Here. Councilmember Freeman. Present. Councilmember Middleton. Here. Councilmember Reese. Here. Thank you. And Councilmember Reese, will you please lead us in the pledge to the flag? I, I thought I would do it as an announcement, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. If it's your practice to do so, and if you're able, please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Council Member. And now we'll have the ceremonial items. And for the first item, uh, the neighbor spotlight, I'm going to ask Council Member Javier Caballero if she would please join me at the microphone. Hi, good evening. Uh, is Ann Drennan here this evening? And if there's any uh, family members or community members who would like to join, Ms. Brennan. So this uh, month, this neighborhood spotlight is uh, for Ann Drennan. She's a recipient of the Neighborhood Spotlight for the month of October 2019. The Neighborhood Spotlight Award recognizes community members that have gone above and beyond in volunteering their time to serve the community. This month, Ann Bren Drennan, excuse me, a resident of Old Sugar Road, was nominated and selected because of the wonder wonderful work she has done in her neighborhood, including, but not limited to, raising awareness about the need for affordable and accessible medical equipment in our community, organizing community volunteers and leaders to find solutions to the community's needs for free access to medical equipment, organizing and managing project access known as HELP, Health Equipment Loan Program. Congratulations, Ms. Drennan, on being the October Neighborhood Spotlight for the City of Durham, and thank you for all the work you do. I'll say one thing. I hope you don't need us, but help is here in Durham. If you don't know of us, have never heard, Google it. Thanks. <laughs> it's always great. The neighborhood spotlight's always very special. And uh, thank you, Councilmember Caballero, for 
presenting it to Ms. Drennan. And congratulations again, Ms. Drennan. Our second item for tonight is the history moment, and uh, I'm going to ask our public historian, Eddie Davis, to please come forward. Uh, we're going to have a great uh, history moment tonight in uh, honor of Dr. John Harding Lucas, Sr. So, uh, Mr. Davis, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you again, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, council members, staff, and audience. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, today is Monday, November the 18th. It is the beginning of the annual National Observance of American Education Week, which always is commemorated during the week preceding Thanksgiving. The stress that 25% of the nation's World War I draftees were illiterate and 9% were physically unfit, representatives of the National Education Association and the American Legion met in 1919, exactly 100 years ago, to seek ways to generate public support for education. Over the years since its 1869 incorporation, Durham has recognized the fact that public education is one of the distinguishing measures that spur upward mobility and advancement into the middle class and beyond. Many state and national education leaders have hailed from Durham. Tonight, I would like to take this history moment to salute one of those great local educators, Dr. John Harding Lucas, Sr. Dr. Lucas is a native of Rocky Mount. He was born on November the 7th, 1920, uh, which means that 11 days ago, he celebrated his 99th birthday and thus has begun his 100th annual orbit of the Earth around the sun. <laughs> Dr. Lucas is a graduate of Shaw University. He served in the United States Army during World War II and was deployed in the Asiatic Pacific Theater. While earning, a master's de while earning a master's degree from both New York University and, Sh and um, um, North Carolina College at Durham, Dr. Lucas taught chemistry and coached at Atkins High School in Kinston before becoming a principal at Orange Street School and Mary Potter High School. In 1963, Lucas, his wife, Blondola, and their children, Cheryl and John Jr., moved to Durham, and he became the principal of Hillside High School. He held that position for 24 years. Today, the school's John H. Lucas Senior Wellness Center is named in his honor. The Lucas Middle School in Durham is jointly named for John Lucas and for Senator Jeannie Lucas. Jeannie Lucas and John Lucas were not related, but they were school system colleagues. While working at Hillside, John Lucas became a leader in the merger of the predominantly white North Carolina Education Association and the predominantly black North Carolina Teachers Association. Originally, discussion centered on the white organization absorbing the black one. Lucas proposed an alternative. In an interview with journalist Evan Schmidt for the 2016 AT&T Heritage Calendar, Lucas said, our interest, in my opinion, was to seek a strong single voice for education with ed equal opportunity. Lucas remembered, my concept was in order to merge, you should bring two groups together on an equal footing. The National Education Association recognized Lucas's brand of equity within the process of merging Southern black and white associations. Thus, the NEA branded his leadership platform, the Lucas Concept. This Lucas Concept was utilized in teacher edu education, I'm sorry, teacher association merger processes in numerous Southern states. His proposals led to the formation of the North Carolina Association of Educators in 1970. In fact, his influence was so impactful that white, black, and Indian educators selected John Lucas to be the person to make the North Carolina merger announcement in front of a national audience of 12,000 educators who were gathered in San Francisco on July 1 of 1970. 
Lucas served as the NCAE state president during the 1974-75 school year. Today, the NCAE continues to bring educators together without regard to ethnicity. In fact, the current vice president of NCAE, Christy Moore, is a teacher on leave from the Durham Public Schools. I don't know if Christy is here or not. Once successful in ex executing the state mergers, Lucas shifted his attention to working as a United States delegate to world conferences on the teaching profession in Ethiopia, in Kenya, in Ireland, in Canada, and in South Korea. He also served on various state and national committees on education issues. Although he was active in state and national education endeavors, his work at Hillside High School continued at a very high level. However, after accumulating a combined total of almost 75 years of education work, John Lucas and his wife Blondola Lucas retired in 1985. However, in 1986, Dr. Lucas rose to an important challenge and accepted the presidency of Shaw University. He worked diligently with alumni and supporters to resolve financial and management problems which threatened the 100-year-old institution. <coughs> Here in Durham in 1992, Lucas was elected to the first school board of the newly merged school system and served as its vice chairperson. At the point of the merger, Lucas applied the Lucas concept again. He advocated that instead of the Durham County Schools absorbing the Durham City Schools, the newly merged school system should have a brand new name and new leadership. Thus, we now have the Durham Public Schools. Lucas has received multiple honors for his work on behalf of education and equal opportunity. In 1982, Shaw University awarded him an honorary, honorary doctorate in Humane Letters. He was named a lifetime honorary board member of the National Education Association in 1972. And in 2009, aided by a nomination process <coughs> initiated by Durham's Minnie Fort Brown, Dr. Lucas received the Lifetime Achievement Award of the National School Boards Association. In 2013, he received the North Carolina Award for Public Service from the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources and from Governor Pat McCurry. With us tonight are several local educators and former student, students who worked with Dr. Lucas at Hillside High School and in the Durham Public Schools. If there are folks who went to Hillside while Dr. Lucas was the principal, or if you went to Hillside at any point, or if you attended any of the Durham Public Schools, would you please stand now? <laughs> Thank you very much. Also here to support Dr. John Lucas, Shaw University Director of Alumni Affairs, Dr. Lamont Johnson, and other members of the Shaw family. Would you please stand now? <laughs> Students and faculty members from the Lucas Middle School, along with family members of Senator Lucas, Senator Jeannie Lucas, uh, and Dr. Lucas. I think we have a delegation from Lucas Middle School here. Yes, we do. The principal. Uh, that's Principal Sanchez, I believe. That's correct. Okay. Rebecca Clayton and Mana Hampton, who were two of the white educators who worked with Dr. Lucas to merge the Durham Black and White Teachers Associations in the late 1960s and 1970s. I believe Rebecca Clayton is here. Would you please stand? So locally, the black and white and Indian teachers and other minorities and other folks worked real closely here in Durham. And Durham became a model for the way that people would cooperatively work to make sure that students and teachers and the schools in general 
work very well together after integration. Pastor Reginald Van Stevens and members of Dr. Lucas's beloved White Rock Baptist Church, where he retains the title of Deacon Emeritus. I think there is a delegation from White Rock here. Would you please stand? During Dr. Lucas's days at Shaw in the 1930s, uh, Dr. Lucas became a member of o the Omega Psi Phi fraternity. His membership has been continuous, and thus, this, is, this makes him one of the longest serving members of the organization throughout this nation and internationally. With these gentlemen who are wearing purple and gold, please. <laughs> these are his member is brothers from Beta Phi chapter here in Durham and other parts of Omega Psi Phi. Would you please stand? Um, Mr. Mayor, I promised Dr. Lucas that he would not have to make a speech. <laughs> However, I did not promise that I would not ask for a rousing round of ovation for Dr. Lucas and the American Education Week that he symbolizes. Thank you so much, Dr. Although it appears that he is willing to make a few comments right now. So would the 99-year-old <laughs> gentleman please come to the microphone? Thank you very, very much. And praise God from whom all blessings flow. Sure would. Come on, Dr. Lucas, look over here towards Eddie. See how we look. <laughs> yeah, come on up. One more. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. Come on up. Dr. Lucas, I think we've got one more from okay. Shaw University. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, you. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Eddie, and thank you so much, Dr. Lucas. Eddie only forgot one thing. Dr. Lucas is also the father of the best athlete ever to come out of Durham, North Carolina. I will say that as well. That's for sure. And now I'm going to ask uh, Council Member Mark Anthony Middleton to join me, which I believe he's already done. Here uh, we have a proclamation uh, to reduce violence everywhere. And I'll ask Wanda Boone. Uh, is Wanda here? Ms. Boone here? She's coming up. Coming. Oh, there she is. Great. And anyone who she would like to have join her, please come on up. And I'll turn this over to Councilmember Middleton. Good evening, everyone. We'll give our friends an opportunity to exit before we get started.
Good evening. My thanks to His Honor the Mayor for allowing me to read this important and wonderful procl proclamation for STRIVE, which stands for Striving to Reduce Youth Violence Everywhere. Y'all hard-headed. She was waving for two, for two minutes. Come on now. <laughs> Is everyone? Proclamation. Whereas adverse childhood experiences cases experienced early in life can lead to a greater risk for committing violence against peers, bullying, teen dating violence and child abuse, elder abuse, intimate partner violence, and sexual violence later in life, and whereas children who are victims of abuse and neglect are more likely to exhibit antisocial behaviors, suffer from anxiety and depression, encounter challenges in school, and abuse drugs or alcohol. And whereas 28% of high school students reported feeling so sad or hopeless almost every day for two weeks or more in a row that they stopped doing usual activities. And whereas 11% of high school students in Durham reported that they did not go to school at least once in the past month because they felt unsafe at school or going to or from school. 51% of high school students have seen other students being bullied, and 37% of high school students report gang activity in school. And whereas people living in low resource communities experience more crime, higher stress levels, less access to resources, higher rates of chronic disease and higher rates of early death. And whereas strategies applied at the community, relationship, and individual levels that include resilience as an antidote to ACEs and that address historical trauma and institutional racism can help prevent multiple forms of violence. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shule, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby call upon all citizens to participate in this call to action and join together for resilient youth, TRY, in the strive to reduce youth violence everywhere, strive, initiative. Witness my hand and the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina, this the 18th day of November, 2019, Stephen M. Shul, Mayor. Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. One of the things that we want to do, or I believe we want to do in Durham, is to prevent violence. It's wonderful to think about all the things that we can do to um, impact violence after it occurs, including helping victims of crime to recover from that trauma. But if we want to see a brighter future for all of us, then we need to really pay more attention to prevention. And so with me are several members of Together for Resilient Youth, and there's so many more. <laughs> um, so thank you for being here with me. Um, if someone experiences four or more adverse childhood experiences before their 18th <laughs> birthday, then the outcomes can be devastating. So those are physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, physical neglect, emotional neglect, uh, mental illness in the home, incarcerated relative, mother treated violently, substance use or divorce, four or more, then these are the possible outcomes. Lack of physical activity, smoking, alcoholism, drug use, missed work, severe obesity, diabetes, depression, suicide attempts, STDs, heart disease, cancer, stroke, COPD and broken bones symbolizing violence. So one of the things we need to think about is instead of asking someone, what did you do? We need to ask what happened to you as the foundation of prevention. So one of the things we do in Together for Resilient Youth is to use community sectors 
in order to spread the word about ACEs and resilience, but also to be authentic carriers of the message. Now, a while back, it used to be that those 10 things were the only thing that were talked about. But now, research shows that institutional racism um, and that historical trauma are also a part of those things that happen that really impact a person's health. And it can lead to someone um, partaking in violent actions later on. Children are children. The adolescent brain doesn't fully develop until someone is 25 years old. So we may say, because they have grown tall, that they should know better, but with the frontal lobes not fully developed, then we as adults need to surround our children to make sure that we protect them in every way that we can and that we also include them in the prevention process. So real quickly, I will say that Stephanie and Angie and Tanya <laughs> are part of the Youth Coalition for ages uh, 9 to 25, college-age students, who help carry this message. So again, um, you often see me or my husband, Earl, uh, but we are not the only ones <laughs> that are involved in this process. So they're in the school. Um, we have the faith community, law enforcement, community members, um, mental health and health. Ashley is back there. Armenius Dobson, Insight, parents, and um, parents that have lost children uh, due to substance use and overdose. We also work in um, the Durham Housing Authority, training individuals to carry this message because you can recover your childhood. And that is really the good news. So we're excited about this work that didn't just start yesterday. We've been around for 17 years. And we've seen substance use among high school students go down. And um, uh, marijuana is going up. That's another conversation. <laughs> um, and the opioid epidemic did not hit Durham in the same way that it did other uh, communities. However, heroin use is going up. And um, we need to look at what's happening in the black community. So we work with everybody. We don't um, uh, single out a certain subset of people. We are community-wide, but still recognizing that historical trauma is an issue. Historical trauma means that uh, as, as slavery uh, uh, has an impact on every single black person at the DNA level. And that's something that we have to talk about. So anyway, we are STRIVE. And the ways that you can get involved, and I'm winding down, <laughs> the ways that you can get involved are from providing information, building skills, providing support, and then environmental change, enhancing and reducing barriers, changing co consequences, uh, looking at physical design and changing physical design and modifying and changing policy. So we do address the social determinants of health, transportation, child, <coughs> you know, and um, providing funds, gap funds for people who need um, those funds intermittently. So that's who we are. The website is durhamtry.org, and I invite you to become a champion of change with us. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Appreciate you being here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councilmember Middleton, and thank, thank you. you all for our ceremonial items tonight. Uh, we will now move to our announcements by members of the council. Are there any announcements by members of the council? I don't believe so. Uh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Yes. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I just want to take a, just a really quick minute to thank so many members of this community, um, particularly members of this council, firstly, and, and members of this community for your wishes of condolences and prayers and good wishes. 
uh, during the bereavement of my family, the passing of my brother Michael. I just returned from New York on Saturday from that funeral and uh, was just overwhelmed by the outpouring of love from this community and the staff from departments throughout the city uh, from so many members of our community. So I want you to know that it is acknowledged. If I don't get to call each and every one of your names individually, know that uh, your love and support were absolutely critical uh, during the season. So I want to thank uh, all who sent well wishes. Uh, secondly, real quick, Mr. Mayor, when I got back on Saturday, I had an opportunity, interesting kind of, I guess, connectivity uh, to attend a wonderful uh, discussion hosted by the Friends of Gear Cemetery uh, regarding the upkeep uh, of that historic cemetery where so many, um, particularly African-American uh, fathers and mothers of this city are buried. I want to be very clear. I'm, I'm well aware that um, Mayor Pro Tem Johnson and Councillor Freeman have been engaged uh, with this issue. Um, but I, I'd like, Mr. Mayor, for us, and it, since we've been talking a lot about racial equity and we just finished cel celebrating 150 years of history in our city, um, racism and institutionalized racism, racism was so pernicious, we know in our country that it followed you to death. Um, and oftentimes the, the dignities that were afforded uh, members of, of other communities were not afforded uh, to black people uh, when they died. Uh, and that was also expressed in the upkeep and maintenance of those cemeteries. Um, I know that the city's been engaged uh, some years ago in, in doing some cleanup there and some graveling, but my hope is that uh, in coming months, perhaps in the coming year, we would at least explore uh, some opportunities to perhaps be a little more involved and intentional uh, in bringing that cemetery up to uh, code. Uh, I don't anticipate that it would be a, a great financial burden on the city to, to uh, keep it looking beautified and to, to honor uh, some of the folk, uh, all of the folk that are buried there, some of whom the history of this city would not be what it is uh, were it not for their contributions. Uh, so no action tonight, but I just want to uh, uh, honor the Friends of Gear Cemetery and, and Durham Preservation Society and keep Durham beautiful for the work they've been doing in that area and would like to put it on our at least our, our intellectual radar as a council um, uh, to perhaps look at ways we can become involved in bringing that cemetery up to code. Finally, Mr. Mayor, this week, uh, I'll be uh, traveling to San Antonio, and I'm going to get to pretend to be you. Uh, mm -hmm. On Thursday, there will be a, uh, an important panel discussion um, highlighting the work of cities that have done work uh, to close the racial gap when it comes to wealth in terms of the work we've done on fines and fees, our DEER program, license restoration program. I know my colleagues would agree that one of the coolest parts of our job is to get to be brand ambassadors for this great city anywhere we are on the globe. And I'm looking forward very much to uh, joining other elected officials from all around the country at the National League of Cities in San Antonio this week where mayors and council people and elected officials and staffs get together to talk about best practices on how to best govern great American <laughs> cities and to build communities that are equitable, that are sustainable, and that are welcoming to all folks. So I look forward to, to being there this week. I thank my colleagues for the excused absence uh, for the work session uh, this Thursday. And Mr. Mayor, I hope to do you proud uh, on Thursday. Councilor, thank you. Councilor Mayor Middleton, I know you will do us proud, and uh, thank you so much for being there and doing that. And uh, again, condolences thank you, sir. on the passing of your brother, and uh, we all feel it for you. Thank you. All right, any other announcements? Council Member Freeman? Thank you. I, um, I just want to make sure that I bring to light, um, in light of uh, the proclamation or the proclamation of, against violence this um evening that I, in the previous meeting, I brought to the attention of my council colleagues some conversations that have been happening in the community around um, some calls for action from this council and recognizing that there are some things that we can do, um, like supporting TRI and the work that they've been providing for this community for over 15 years, or like many other groups, like Communities in Partnership, who's doing the food pantry, or Spirit House that does a harm-free zone or a chance for change, who does the standing in the way of violence. Um, I could go on and on. I mean, love and respect. There's so many organizations that we could um, look to engage in our conversations um, immediately as they are doing the work already. I hope that we'll have the conversation at some point. I am recognizing that um, it takes a, you know, a vote of four of us. So I will continue to bring this um, forward, recognizing that the community called for a day of healing and uh, to honor the police chief's request. Also noting for the parks and recs locations to be not just open, but welcoming. And then also noting that 
those resources need to be made available to actually to actual credible me messengers in the community who are doing the work. Mm -hmm. And I just want to make sure that I keep bringing that up until we do address it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, one additional thing. Um, I, I feel it's probably um, appropriate to probably share, um, noting that time will pick up with the holidays coming along, that on January 15th, a group of us within Poverty Durham and um, the Episcopalians United Against Racism will be hosting a conversation for a case for reparations with uh, Sandy Darity, Professor Sandy, Dr. Sandy Darity, and his partner, I don't want to mess her name up. Kirsten Mullen. Yes, Kirsten. And I would love to invite you all to attend and to make sure that everyone's aware it will be held on January 15th. And that is an event that I am announcing. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Any further announcements? All right, thank you. If not, uh, we are now at the consent agenda. The consent agenda can be, I'm sorry, we're not at the consent agenda. We're now at the priority items by the city manager. I'm sorry, Mr. Manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council, good evening. I uh, don't have any priority items this evening, but I would like to uh, tag on uh, Council Member Middleton's uh, representation of the city government and the work we're doing at the uh, National League of Cities Conference. We'll have two other staff persons on panels that will be uh, also highlighting uh, the work of Durham. Uh, our Budget Management Services Director, Bertha Johnson, will be there, as well as I believe Ryan uh, Smith might be there. And... Uh, we will also be receiving two national awards uh, yet to be announced, but uh, we're very proud of that as well. So thank you. I'll bring them back. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Manager, for that announcement. And we're excited about those awards and are looking forward to hearing more about them. Madam Attorney. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. The city Attorney's Office has no priority items this evening. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Good evening, everyone. The city clerk's office has no items. Thank you. I think that this might now be the appropriate time for a couple of motions. One, we need a motion for an excused absence uh, for tonight's meeting for Councilmember Austin. So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded that, that we grant Councilmember Austin an excused absence for tonight. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. And the motion passes 6-0. Thank you. I will be uh, attending the uh, North Carolina Metro Mayor's meeting on uh, December the 5th, which is the day of a work session, and we'll need an excused absence for that meeting. Uh, can I have a motion uh, for an excused absence on uh, December the 5th work session? So moved. Okay. Moved and seconded to give me an excused absence on the December 5th work session. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much. And now we'll get to the consent agenda. The consent agenda are, is, is made up of items that have previously been considered by the council. And the consent agenda can be approved by a single vote of the council. Items can be moved from the removed from the consent agenda by any member of the public or any member of the council. And if they are so removed, will be heard at the end of the meeting. Item one, Durham Convention and Visitors Bureau, DBA, Discover Durham, Joint City County Representative Reappointment. Item two, FY 2020-2021 budget development schedule. Item three, review and discuss council interim hiring and onboarding. Item four, selection of Chrysalis Research and Consulting LLC for the preparation of a five-year consolidated plan, annual action plan, and analysis of impediments to fair housing choice. Item, item five, contract amendment, the Housing Authority, the City of Durham Community Development Block Grant subrecipient contract for the rehabilitation of Laurel Oaks townhouses. Item six, approval of dedicated housing and community development block grant funds to reinvestment partners Inc. for the rehabilitation of 2816 Ross Road. Item seven, interlocal agreement with Durham County on funding for the Veranda at Whitted School affordable housing project. Item eight, First Amendment to Durham Community Land Trust Inc. DCLT for giveable construction permanent loan agreement for the Southwest Central Durham Home Rental Rehabilitation Project. Item nine, grant project ordinance for Durham County Transit Plan. Item 10, contract for water supply storage in Jordan Lake. Item 11, Triangle Land Conservancy, O'Neill Watershed Protection Project, authorization to participate. Item 12, purchase contract with Brady Integrated Security for citywide access control standardization project. 
Item 13, First Amendment to contract with Cedar Grove Institute for Sustainable Communities to develop a strategic plan for shared economic prosperity for the residents of the city of Durham. Item 14, contract with Morris and McDaniel, Inc. to conduct promotion testing, assessment services, and job task analysis. Item 15, cooperative purchase group, police mobile command center contract. Item 16, 2019 law enforcement mental health and wellness program grant project ordinance. <clears throat> Item 17, emergency watershed protection and watershed restoration project grant project ordinance. Item 18, emergency watershed protection professional services, EWP 2020-01. Item 33, Mayor Hispanic Latino Committee appointments. You have heard the consent agenda and I will now entertain a motion for their approval. Did you have uh, information from Ms. Peterson, Madam Clerk? What would the item be, Ashley? 33. All right, thank you. We will pull item 33. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now have a motion to approve the uh, the consent agenda with the exception of item 33. So moved. Move. Second. Moved and second that we approve the consent agenda. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The motion passes 6-0. Thank you. We'll now move to our general agenda, business agenda, and we'll begin with item 19, the 2019 third quarter crime report. And we'll welcome Chief Davis and her staff. <clears throat> welcome, Chief. It's good to see you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Honorable Mayor Shule, Honorable Council, City Manager Tom Bonfield, and our City Attorney Kim Rayburn. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present the third quarter crime report this evening. This report covers the Durham Police Department's five performance measures, our part one, violent crime, part one, property crime, the department's overall clearance rates, response times for priority calls for service, and sworn and civilian employee staffing levels. I'll also discuss briefly other highlights that occurred during the third quarter. Yeah. There were 32 homicides during the first nine months of 2019 compared to 24 in the same period of 2018. There were 36 <laughs> incidents, but the count is 32 homicides because three cases have been cleared as self-defense, and one case was classified as negligent manslaughter, which is determined to be an unintentional shooting. So far, there have been five homicide cases that occurred in prior years, cleared in 2019. The number of reported sexual assaults dropped by 18%. 77 versus 94 for the same reporting period. There were 19 cases from previous years that have been reported during the first nine months of 2019, approximately one quarter of our cases. Robberies dropped significantly during the first nine months of 2019 to the lowest third quarter numbers in three years, 16% of robberies were from businesses, which include eight bank robberies. The number of shooting incidents increased by 17%, and the number of shooting victims increased by 5% during the first nine months of 2019. More than a quarter, 27% of aggravated assault incidents were determined to be domestic. 38% of all aggravated assaults in the third quarter came from a multi victim firearms incidents. The percentage of this category, the multi-victim category, 31% in both the first quarter and the second quarter. Our focus and efforts have been to reduce the number of aggravated assaults, particularly multi-victim aggravated assaults. 
The percentage for multi-victim firearms incidents during the first nine months of 2019 is 34%. Our goal has been 30%. New clicker here. So part one, property crime, January to September. Burglaries were at a three-year low for the first nine months of the year. There were decreases in residential and commercial burglaries, but there was a brief spike in miscellaneous category, which includes sheds and construction sites. Larcenies comprised almost two-thirds, which was 63% of all part one crime, 43% of all reported larcenies were from motor vehicles or involved auto parts and accessories. More than a quarter, 29% of all larcenies involved shoplifting. So 72% of all larcenies are either thefts from vehicles or shoplifting. Almost half of the guns stolen this year, 49%, 126 of the 256 were taken during break-ins in vehicles. And again, Honda Accords were the most stolen vehicle model during the first nine months of 2019. At least 46% of vehicles stolen this year had keys left in the vehicle or the vehicle was left with the engine running. This is a reoccurring theme. As we entered the cold season, we want to remind everyone Again, especially during the holidays when people are scurrying about in a hurry, that it's not a good idea to leave your car running with the keys in it. This is a recur reoccurring theme here in Durham. Vehicle thefts stemming from the desire to get into a warm car result in vehicles stolen. So our clearance rates, we compare our department's clearance rates to other departments of our size in the category of 250,000 to 499 or 500,000 population and FBI generated clearance rates. Our clearance rates were better than the average for cities our size in all categories but aggravated assault and violent crime during the first nine months of 2019. The aggravated assault clearance rate is affected by the number of multi-victim firearm cases since these cases are often difficult to clear. Keep in mind also that the clearance rates for 2018 and the FBI Peer City results are for the entire year of total cases cleared. We will update our clearance rates, the totals, at the end of the calendar year. That'll be sometime in February or so, 2020. Our homicide clearance rates include five cases cleared from prior years as well, where the incident actually occurred in prior years. So priority one calls for service. There were 6,056 priority one calls for service in the first nine months of 2019 which is actually a 10% decrease from the same period in 2018. Our average response time was 5.92 minutes, which was close to meeting the target of 5.8 minutes. We answered 55% of priority one calls in less than five minutes in the first nine months of 2018. Our goal is 57% under five minutes. Six to 11 minutes is as has been um, the average for other comparable cities too. Education has played a significant role in citizens using other reporting platforms to report crimes. Our communications um, dispatchers do an excellent job in working the triage calls so that they aren't dispatched to officers unnecessarily. So we believe that some of the work with the P2C platform where individuals are going to um, our software platforms to uh, make police reports and also vetting of calls um, through communications has helped as well. Okay. Staffing levels. Our sworn staffing was at 97% at the end of September 2019. 
Our non-sworn staffing was at 92% at the end of September 2019. 19 recruits from Basic Law Enforcement Training Academy number 49 graduated on September 18th. There are currently 20 recruits in BLET number 50 who will graduate in February 2020. Two officers completed the advanced law enforcement training, which is known as our ALEP program during the third quarter. This is an accelerated program for officers who are already North Carolina state certified. So you visa requests for the quarter, the Durham Police Department processed 47. You visa requests during the third quarter of 2019. 57% of the requests, 27 out of 47, were approved. For the first nine months of the year, 2019, we processed a total of 157 U visa requests. So a few other highlights for the quarter. Uh, three new pieces of public art were unveiled on July 30th at DPT headquarters. And um, during the placemaking at headquarters celebration, we had several people from the community to come out and speak. Each piece of artwork expresses a theme of common thread and a symbolic, and the symbolic badge that you've probably seen out in front of the building. It's the shape, uh, more contemporary shape of a badge structure in the front of the building. The, it, it sort of represents the weaving together of ethnicities and cultures in a very diverse city. The unveiling marked the culmination of an 18-month process coordinated by the city's police department, general services department, office of economic and workforce development, and public art committee in collaboration with Durham Technical Community College. It was a great event. Other high highlights was National Night Out held on August 6th in more than 90 neighborhoods throughout Durham. We had another awesome national night out with lots of participation by community organizers, citizens, and elected officials. Thank you all for supporting National Night Out as well. National Night Out is one of um, the department's favorite community events, which allows us to fellowship and get to know our community members from a variety of demographics. Just a few before I finish, a few other highlights that I'd like to bring out. Some of, some of this is already in the written report, but I'd like to say some of this publicly, that um, we initiated a homicide uh, cold case um, detective who has begun working on cold cases in the Durham Police Department. Um, we also arrested a primary suspect in the Zion Person case, and that case is seeking federal prosecution Six other significant homicide arrests occurred for cases in 2016, 18, and 19. After launching our anti-gun violence campaign this summer, during the month of June, we rolled out a 60-day initiative that focused on reducing violent crime. 94 felony arrests were made and 24 guns were seized. Details are also in the accompanying report for that particular operation. Um, this year, or at least this quarter, we made several robbery arrests, one involving a repeat offender conducting buy-sell robberies on the internet. At least five incidents were associated with this individual. Um, our misdemeanor diversion program, there were 316 referrals to the program, 100% uh, completion rate for those individuals, which was really good. 75% of those referrals came from the Durham Police Department. We um, also held a child safety seat event sponsored by our TAC unit, our accident crash unit. Uh, the community engagement unit held a bicycle repair event for children. Investigator Judy Rodriguez became the first Durham Police Department officer to receive certification from the International Association of Fraud Examiners. She now works with the OIG's office investigating financial fraud in the Durham area, which is a, a very significant for us. We get a lot of financial fraud cases. At least four employees received City of Durham Stars Awards in integrity, customer service, and fairness. The department is also receiving on November 26th the North Carolina Dogwood Award by Attorney General Josh Stein. 
Um, it'll be presented to our forensics unit and other individuals who have been working on sexual assault case reductions. Um, Officer Ramos was recognized for exceptional and courageous response in a Cornwallis <coughs> fire incident, and she's also being recognized as a North Carolina JC's outstanding young public servant for other work she has done in our Hispanic community. Um, Major Sherry Montgomery, Captain Walter Tate, Captain Melissa Bishop, and Lieutenant DM Anthony graduated from the Police Executive Research Forum, the Senior Management Leadership Institute. I'm very proud of them as well. And the last thing that I will add is that we have two members of our executive team who have announced their retirement. That is Deputy Chief Anthony Marsh and Deputy Chief Terrence Assembly. It's very possible that um, the next time you see me presenting, they will no longer be with the Durham Police Department. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank them for the work that they have done during my tenure with the Durham Police Department to be agile in the midst of change, to support me in various initiatives. And I know whatever the next chapter holds for them, they will be exceptional in it. So thank you very much. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Chief. And uh, we'll, 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 uh, we have some speakers, but first we'll have uh, questions and comments from members of the council, and then we'll hear from our speakers. But uh, Chief Marsh, Chief Assembly, want to just add to what the Chief says to express our appreciation to you all for all the fantastic service that you have rendered to our city. Uh, all of us on the council and our whole community is in your debt. And I just want to second the chief's appreciation. And, and I'll be looking forward to hearing what you all are going to be doing in your retirement. Uh, I hope it's uh, I hope it's fun. <laughs> uh, we'll now have questions and comments from members of the council, and then we'll uh, hear from any speakers that we have. Questions or comments? Council Member Reese. Just briefly, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, how's it going, Chief Davis? Absolutely. Um, before I get to you, I just want to thank again the two folks you signaled uh, from your executive staff who are going to be leaving us. I don't, it's hard to imagine the Durham Police Department without the two of you, especially from my perspective. Um, and I will just also say that Chief Marsh, I don't know if you remember the first time I met you was when you started uh, doing the community outreach around the police warrant body camera policy. Um, <laughs> and I had not then and have not since uh, seen a public servant go about that very difficult work in the way that you did. You were extraordinary during that process. I told you that then, and I will never forget the way that you were engaged in some very difficult conversations with people around the community who have very different values about that particular issue, whether they want to be told they're being recorded, whether they want the option, what to do with the footage, and you were the quintessential public servant during that process. I'll never forget it, so thank you for your service. Really appreciate it. Chief, I wanted to first, you mentioned every, almost everything I wanted to talk about uh, from the back half of the report. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to call out the allocation of resources to the cold case unit, yes. homicides. It is so important that, our, uh, that the families of victims know that we have not forgotten these cases. Absolutely. And that allocation of resources is really personally meaningful, and so I appreciate that. The other thing I wanted to mention is that you mentioned a lot of officers. You couldn't mention everyone, but I wanted to pull Officer D.T. Stocks out of the report yeah. and, and hold uh, up that officer uh, who was approached uh, in mid-September um, by a person who was having uh, trouble paying for a hotel and feeding their family mm -hmm. and the officer and other officers. It's always an officer and then a bunch of other officers. They rope in to help, um, uh, helped uh, get them some food, help them uh, stay in the hotel for a bit. Uh, I just want to make sure that you give him my phone number. If he comes into these situations again, <laughs> just give me a call. I'll see what I can do. Thank you. Um, but more directly, I just wanted to say that um, I continue to be impressed with the quality of your leadership in this community, the work that you've done over a difficult year, um, the way that we have continued to have a very positive working relationship, and the fact that um, that that your department is responding 
heroically to the, to the world that we're living in right now. And I just want to say thank you so much uh, for all the work you do. Really love that the staffing numbers are so high. That's a really good sign. Hopefully we for can us. keep it that way. Yeah, we're going to keep it that way. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Mr. Thank Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Other Council Members, questions or comments? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and thank you, Chief, for your report. Um, we got notice recently of a grant that we were receiving um, to clear up some of our old sexual assault um, test kits backlog. Yeah. Yes. Really excited to hear about that and was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how we got that resource and how we're going to be putting it to use. Absolutely. And that was kind of one of my bullet points, but I didn't want to run too long. But um, we applied for this grant um, through the Department of Justice and we were awarded the grant. So um, it's a three-year grant. It's um, right at about a million dollars. And it is to support the Durham Police Department and not just eradicating the, um, the backlog, which is dwindling. And we, we're getting a lot of recognition from that too because of the deliberate intent in, in working those cases. But it's also so that um, we can uh, hire a, a DA's uh, ADA in the, in the um, DA's office as well so that when we get hits and there is the potential to prosecute that we will have the resources that we need to investigate and prosecute. So we're excited about that. We're in the embryonic stages right now of actually planning what that rollout looks like. But I'll be glad to provide more information on the narrative of what we asked for as well. Thank you so much. It, it is. It's very substantial. Yeah, it's, it's a huge grant, and it'll make a huge difference. So I'm um, really excited to see how that moves forward. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Freeman. Thank you. I also want to echo my colleagues in thanking you for your service, as well as Chief Marsh and Chief Solstice. I um, can't say how um, much I appreciate just, just what you guys do in this community and the way that you handle it. It's, um, it's commendable how uh, approachable that you, each of you are and how much you attend to the kind of people, to, to the people in the community as if they were your neighbors. Like, it's appreciated. I, I um, also want to commend our chief and recognizing that the service you do in and out of uniform definitely is also commendable, and I was fortunate enough to attend your sister to sister event um, Saturday. Saturday at the health department with um, our DA Satana DeBerry, and I was really um, motivated and touched um, in a way that I want to be uh, careful about and, and making sure that I follow your lead. Mm -hmm. But I do want to hear more about exactly how you guys have been able to partner and figure out ways that you can work around some of the shortcomings or the short resources beyond just the million dollar grant and um, addressing some of the issues. I know <laughs> I want to lift up the one of the cases or one of the women that stood up and shared her story yes. about how a rape kit was lost and how her case would never be heard really hit home and recognizing just how many people never get the justice and I know far too many women who have been survivors yeah. of sexual abuse. I, um, yes, I think we were all moved by that testimony. But yeah. I, I really was um, also very, uh, I guess, like I, I only intended to stay probably 10, 15 minutes. I think I ended up staying about an hour. But there was so much information you were sharing regarding resources for people in the community. And I'd really love for you to take a moment and to share some of that. So um, the conversation sort of um, took a turn just um, to, to discuss education in general and how do we educate individuals. And the testimony that we all experienced during, even though that was not a Durham Police Department case, um, it was still very moving. And um, I think it touched everyone to hear the the intimate details of what an individual had gone through and how uh, that person continues to carry that. But, um, and then we personalized some of um, that conversation. Um, I gave an example of a, a young man, and this could happen to anybody, a young man who is almost like a nephew to me. 
and this person was in a relationship with, uh, he was 17 at the time, and he was in a relationship with a 15-year-old. And um, the mother came home and caught them, even though there was not an act there. But the lack of education on the part of that young man, and, and, and of course the young lady who was involved, it caused charges to be placed on the 17-year-old. And he's about 25 now, and he still carries those charges because of the fact that in the state of Georgia, a 17-year-old um, could be considered um, a rapist or that situation could have been considered a statutory rape charge. So he continues to carry that even though this particular case was dismissed. But we shared a lot of information about how we need to educate our young people, how we need to educate our, our um our students on college campuses and that no means no and that um, sometimes the other contributing factors that come into play that aggravate those kinds of situations is there's a need for more forums for that kind of discussion, open and honest discussions because um, a person's career could be lost or a person could um, be violated in a way and um, we, we sort of want to be on the preventive end. And then also I note that um, the child abuse cases oh, yeah. as well, it's, it's, it's important that people acknowledge just how vulnerable our children are in this community to sexual abuse. Absolutely. And sexual assault. Absolutely. And who has to actually take that report and follow the leads mm -hmm. to yes. see the case through. Yes. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you, Chief. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. Good evening, Chief. And good evening. Command staff, always good to see you. Um, Chief, before we made the historic hire and bringing you here, I don't think uh, Chief Marsh's uh, shoulders were quite as blinged out. <laughs> and uh, nobody called me honorable at that time at all. But during that time when, when I was uh, working with so many other people in this city to transform our police department, to transform the culture, I know uh, Chief Marsh wasn't always happy to see me coming as we sat across many tables. Um, but I, I just wanna <laughs> publicly say that the temperament and the professionalism and, and the steady hand that you brought to that work, to those times, and to those discussions um, were just above board, just, just, just above and beyond. Um, I think with a lot of folk in your position uh, would have displayed. So I just wanna commend you for just the even handedness uh, that you've displayed and the temperament and the professionalism uh, over the years. Immense respect for you, and, and you're a young man, so I, I look forward to seeing what you do uh, after you take the uniform off Chief Simley as well uh, for your leadership uh, and your temperament as well uh, over the years. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing how fast time flies, but I wish you both the best uh, as you do. Case, I'm going to be bothering you for a while, so you're, you're going to be around <laughs> uh, for a while. Um, Chief, congratulations on, on some of those high-profile arrests uh, that you made. We, of course, the presumption of innocence is on everyone. Right. So the trial comes, but we do want to congratulate you and, and the women and men under your command uh, for those arrests. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the um, uh, shootings um, in our city. Uh, while this government has not declared the state of emergency in our city, we have not officially declared that, um, there are some residents and citizens who feel that way. Um, and I hear from them all the time. Um, and I'm not even talking about the gunfire that gets reported, the shootings that we do respond to. There are people in this city who every night hear gunfire in neighborhoods. That's a reality. Um, not just a few, a lot. Um, I saw a media report uh, a couple of weeks ago where you were interviewed, and, and I'm, I'm, I want to quote you correctly. Uh, I think you were speaking about um, additional officers, and I, you said, quote, I needed them then, I need them now. Um, there's only seven people in this city uh, that are vested with the power uh, to make that happen in the budgetary cycle, and they're here right now. So I, I was pretty clear who your audience was uh, in that interview. Um, you also talked about a plan to augment the gang task force um, in response to what's been going on um, of late. So I just want to ask you very directly, uh, as the seven people in this city that, that can uh, act, if you will, um, I want to ask, is there something, is there a specific ask, is there something this council can do outside of our regular budgetary cycle to, to, to augment your capabilities, to help you and your department 
uh, address the issues you have. I know the city manager is empowered to spend up to a certain threshold without calling us, but, but outside of the traditional budgetary cycle, is there something this government can do uh, uh, to help you in the short term and to convey to the people of this city that although we're not declaring an emergency, we get it and we understand that, that there's an issue going on uh, and that people are scared and people are upset and, and they're looking to us for leadership. So, so if it's a price, what's the price? If it's, if it's a declaration, whatever it is, is there something this government can do in the short term? Councilmember Middleton, if I could interrupt. Sure. Please, uh, I have had conversations with uh, Chief Davis over the last couple of weeks. I don't know if that was completely a rhetorical question or a direct question of her. I'll let you, uh, you respond to that. But uh, certainly uh, I've asked the police department to, uh, uh, particularly around the, uh, the gang unit, to uh, um, provide me some additional information so that uh, um, both she and uh, Sheriff Burkett are working on that issue, but provide me some additional information over the next several weeks, and uh, we'll be reporting back to the council about what that might look like. Uh, and to directly answer your question, assuming it wasn't rhetorical, there, there is, you know, there are many avenues by which the, uh, the council has the authority or, or the ability to, uh, to supplement resources mid-budget. Right, uh, it wasn't rhetorical. Um, it, 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 and I appreciate the manager's uh, um, uh, information. I, well, let, let me just say for the record, and I, I look forward to that uh, reporting. Um, I, I want to go on record uh, saying that, that uh, whatever comes back, if it's reasonable and within our power, uh, that, that we should do it. Um, we should act. Um, I also want to go on record saying that I am, I am not going to pretend or play the game that anyone that's seriously engaged in this conversation is going to suggest that there's something causally linked between what has happened and what we do now. No one serious is saying that any action this council takes or could have taken could have prevented a particular shooting or a particular incident. I think the conversation des deserves much more serious engagement than that. But I think what needs to be uh, displayed and said is that um, we have the moral credibility to look our folk in the eye and to say we have done everything we can do at least to create an atmosphere where things like this are less likely. No one is suggesting that there's a causal link, hard causal link, but I, I do think that, uh, at, you know, I won't always be on the council. One day I'm going to be a private citizen again, and I'd like to be able to say that my government, when they look at me, has done everything within their power to create an atmosphere, to create a context so that we have the moral authority, even if we can't say we couldn't have stopped that one, we have created a context in which these things are less likely. Uh, so with that said, I look forward to the report um, and I look forward to, to acting and voting uh, if there's something to vote for and if there's some appropriation to be made outside of our regular uh, budgetary cycle because I think we are at a moment uh, that calls for that type of engagement. Uh, thank you again, uh, Chief, and thank, uh, thanks to the men and women under your command. I appreciate you. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, anyone else? Comments, questions? Council Member Caballero. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chief. Um, just a couple of things. Um, I, it was, I was very happy to see Officer Ramos uh, named. Uh, she is a stellar officer, and I've had uh, wonderful experience with her. And yes. reading the report, I was not surprised to see that's how she reacted. Yes. Um, and then I just want to say I'm very pleased with the U visa uh, numbers. I know that earlier this year there was a commitment made that the current time limitation would be lifted and just wondering a little bit around what your thoughts were there and what plans were uh, thinking into 2020. Well, actually, I would need to really look. I, I don't know how many other cases that we do have. Um, at this point, we, are, we have just about gotten to everything that's been out there, but I'd have to get back to you to let you know that. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. Any other comments or questions? Chief, thank you very much. We appreciate you. And I'll ask thank you. you. I'll ask thank you. you. I, didn't, I didn't say it, but I, I appreciate my command staff being here as well and all the work that they do to, um, you know, work around the resources that we have. Thank you. Um, again, thank you for this council support of the Durham Police Department. I'll just point out yeah. Matt, Ms. Peterson. Uh, Ms. Peterson, I will call on you at the appropriate time. Thank you. Chief, if I could ask you and your staff to please uh, go back to your seats, that would be great. Thank you very much. We appreciate you all being here.
We have <coughs> have seven people signed to signed up to speak on this item, and I'm going to call their names. And if when I call your name, if you could come over here to my right, that would be great. Uh, and um, I will give each of you three minutes. The first speaker will be Andrea Muffin Hudson. The second will be Chris Tiffany. And the third will be Deborah Friedman. If you all could please come to my right. And Ms. Hudson, welcome. You're up first, and you have three minutes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, don't worry. Your time doesn't begin till you start. <laughs> Welcome. Please give us your name and address. Um, my name is Andrea Hudson. Um, I live at 322 Junction Road, um, Bentwood Apartments. Um, I had questions for the police chief and her officers, only because I've been getting calls recently from um, law-abiding citizens who have been pulled over by either the sheriffs or the police. From your watch commander, he said it was sheriffs that had on police shirts in, in police cars, but um, they're taking registered handguns from these citizens. And then when we go downtown, there's no paperwork showing where they've taken these handguns. And I've had two families who have missing handguns, and one family is missing at least six because it's happened multiple occasions where the officers are um, kicking in their doors and taking their firearms. And I really would like to know what's going on with that because if there's no paperwork for these guns, and we've been to the sheriff's department because we figured <coughs> maybe it is the sheriff's, and we've gone to the police department, and no one can say where these guns have gone. And my fear is those guns are back out on our streets yep. and that they are the ones that have their serials numbers erased because we have one of the biggest gangs in the city taking the guns from these citizens. And we really need to figure out what, who these officers are because they're wearing these face masks where you can only see their eyes. And they're wearing black shirts to say police on the front. So you can't even get their badge numbers. And they're snatching phones from people so you can't even identify the cars that they're in because some are in patrol cars and then some are in unmarked police cars. So um, if we can figure that out. Ms. Hudson, be happy. thank you for your... Tom, let me just say that if you have a specific complaint, mm -hmm. the, the obviously no one can deal with just a blanket complaint that you've described. If you have a specific complaint about a specific incident, please make that known to the police department. I did. We went to the police department okay. on October the 11th. Um, it was a little bit after midnight after we went to the, um, the jail to bail the young man out, but they let him out, you know, on a signature bond, and we went to the police headquarters to file a police report. And the watch commander, who I took a picture of, and I'll be happy to show you his picture, that they wouldn't take the police report, I mean the complaint, because we didn't have officers' names and we didn't have car numbers. So he wouldn't take anything. He just kept telling us, well, maybe it's just the sheriffs wearing, you know, T-shirts that have police on them because the sheriffs did stop. And the sheriffs did do the stop. And the sheriffs, when they did a stop, they called it in and said that they were in a high-speed chase, which really isn't true, because if anyone knows where North Briggs and Holloway is, the individual lives in the middle of Holloway before you get to Raven and Holloway. So it wasn't a high-speed chase, but that's what the sheriff's department called it in as. I'm going by what the watch commander told me. He said in the police, he told them to fall back from that call, but the victim said that the police were the ones who pulled up his shirt, took pictures of his tattoos, and they took the firearm that was out of the glove compartment. Okay, thank you, Ms. Hudson. If you can see why the police will need specific information to do an investigation. So if you can provide license numbers or you can provide names, our police department investigates every complaint, and they actually investigate a lot of complaints, uh, mainly com mainly things that they themselves uh, find in terms of disciplinary concerns, mm -hmm. as well as some complaints that we do get from residents. But any, any resident complaint will be investigated, but it needs to have some specific information. So if you have the name or badge number uh, or license number. We can't get that because they're wearing t-shirts that say police that don't have badge numbers on it. And they're taking people's phones so they can't record the license plate numbers or the card numbers because they're unmarked 
Chargers. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll. Miss Lieutenant Bishop's in the back. She can take the information. You, All right. See Lieutenant Bishop. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Hudson. Mr. Tiffany, welcome. Please give us your name and address. You have three minutes. Chris Tiffany, um, I don't know how to get to my, I'm supposed to have a, here we go. There we go, all right. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Chris Tiffany, Post Office Box 25331-27702. What was called the political arithmetic of status is now called statistics. We need statistics. When we talk about social problems, but statistics are the result of social processes that determine what will and will not be counted. Police officials tend to us for underestimate. Political purpose is often hidden, and it is naive to accept numbers as accurate without examining who created them and why. Why you harass our kids? Because that's who commits the crimes, young black males. If that ain't racial profiling, I don't know what is. But when a boy <coughs> and his mother submitted a written complaint about a random stop, the complaint disappeared just like a cop told witnesses that he could make them disappear, and that cop was singled out for commendation in the last quarterly report. Not only are random stops and searches of innocent boys and use of force not counted, even when documented by civilians, but real criminals, even drive-by shooters, go free because you need to protect informants who have information. Don't deny it. Don't deny it. Violent crime is heating up. Climate change denial is funded by fossil fuel money. And, crimes, and crime PR problems threaten a variety of business interests. Crimes reported by the police are often not the same as crimes reported to the police. And although it's hard to reclassify homicides, cause of death is sometimes inaccurate and some missing persons might be dead. But homicide counts tend to be more accurate than other crimes. Officials may respond to critics by defending existing policies as adequate or can't do anything about domestic violence or incumbents try to imply it's not so bad or Oh, well, maybe we are worse than average, but look over there, or back then, it's, it's worse over there, or back then, cherry-picking one point years ago that was almost as bad as now. The election's over now, and now you can admit we do have serious problems, and existing policies are not adequate. A highly publicized drive-by shooting case has been cleared, but not by stopping and searching random young black male pedestrians. According to racial profiling stats created by police stopping and searching random young black males in or from unmarked target areas, the drive-by shootings, who knows who the drive-by shootings are? Someone knows, but you have to protect informants. Protect <coughs> informants. I'm sorry, I'm clumsy here. Thank you, Mr. Tiffany. Ms. Friedman, welcome. You have three minutes. Please give us your name and address. Uh, Deborah Friedman, 1109 East Hardscrabble Drive, Hillsborough, 27278. Thank you for allowing me to speak before council. Durham's gun violence deserves a better response than your weak deflection, people need housing, or climate change is the biggest problem facing Durham. Your stubborn refusal to prioritize people's lives over your beyond policing agenda should raise the alarm for cities across America. Sacrificing people's lives for your agenda at any cost will lead to more people dying in the streets of Durham. Durham City Council's actions prove you don't support the police department. Give Chief Davis the funds she needs for police hires. If you don't, Durham will continue to, to enjoy the shameful reputation as being weak on crime. A lack of police presence lays out the welcome mat for criminals. No longer is it acceptable for you to say black lives matter, but offer no solutions to save black lives. We now see how your willingness to sacrifice min minorities don't, that don't adapt to your narrow progressive vision. One councilman offered to revisit shot spotter technology if more data was provided, citing a surveillance concern. The NYU School of Law performed an audit, concluded that the risk of voice surveillance is extremely low. The report notes that there are no important design frameworks and operational safeguards built into how shops, shot spotter operates to prevent this from happening. While it surely 
while it is surely possible that shot spotter sensors will on occasion capture some intelligible voice audio related to a gunfire incident, we have little concern that the system will be used for anything approaching voice surveillance. Other policing technology companies should follow shot spotters leadership and proactively embrace their responsibility to protect individual liberty with their products. Barry Friedman, Policy Project Faculty Director. This city council's concerns over surveillance should be allayed by this independent report. I will hope you'll finally address the need for a police presence and or shot spotters technology. Countless lives can be saved by spending 325,000. Recalibrate your moral setting, city council. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Friedman. I will now hear from Monica Rose. I'm having a hard time reading that. Uvisa? Oh, it's about, it says U visas, I see. Monica Rose, and it says U visas. Welcome. Please give us your name and address, and you have three minutes. My name is Monica Rosa. My address is 2520 in Chapel Hill Road, Durham. No sé qué decirle. I don't know what to say. Veníamos preparados para celebrar, para festejar, para dar las gracias a cada uno de ustedes, a la jefa policía. We came here prepared to celebrate, to thank you, um, to thank the chief of police. Pero lamentablemente no podemos celebrar. But unfortunately we can't celebrate. Um, ella nos prometió que iba a cambiar la póliza de la visa U. She promised to change the policy on U visas. Hace seis meses atrás, hoy justamente hace los seis meses. Six months ago, and today would mark six months from that point. En nosotros el grupo visa U nos sentimos muy, muy dolidos. Yo me siento lo personal con bronca, con rabia, con ganas de llorar. We, the U visa group, were very hurt. I personally feel um, raged. Uh, I, I want to cry. Mi nombre es Laura Loesa, 710 Melanie Street. Ah, uh, bueno, hoy es un. Pensamos que era un día uh, bueno para la comunidad latina. We thought today was going to be a good day for the Latinx community. Porque la jefa nos había prometido que iba a quitar las restricciones. Because the chief had promised that she was going to remove the restrictions. Desafortunadamente, no cumplió su promesa. Unfortunately, she did not follow through on her word. Pero aquí estamos y vamos a seguir luchando por la comunidad. But we are here. We're going to continue to advocate and, and um, fight for our community. Que hasta ahora sigue habiendo mucha violencia, muchos asaltos, muchos asesinatos, sobre la comunidad latina y nadie ha hecho nada. Because right now in our community we see a lot of assaults, um, a lot of robberies. ¿Qué otra cosa dijo? Y nadie ha hecho nada. And nobody has done anything about it. Es la única oportunidad que esas personas que han sufrido violencia, asalto, a mano armada puedan tener una oportunidad de tener a un permiso de trabajo, de estar aquí con su familia, con sus hijos. This is the unique opportunity for families who have been victims and have gone through um, hardship by uh, violence and, and, and crime to have an opportunity to, to be with their kids, to have protection and be with their kids. A cada uno de ustedes que están ahí sentado, hemos hablado, le hemos contado nuestra historia. Each of you that is sitting there in uh, city council seats, we've had conversations with each of you about Hemos this. pedido su apoyo. We've asked for your support. Para que esas personas que no pueden calificar para una visa U, puedan hacerlo. So that those uh, people who don't qualify for a U visa can qualify. Entonces yo, en nombre de todas esas personas, en nombre de la comunidad, quiero pedirles que nos apoyen y sigamos trabajando para que la jefa pueda quitar las restricciones. And I, uh, on behalf of uh, all the people, including the visa, uh, U visa group, I'm asking you so that we can continue this work so that we can uh, ask the chief to remove the restrictions on U visa. Gracias. Thank you. Hola, buenas noches. Mi nombre es Silvia Segundo. Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Silvia Segundo. La verdad, estoy aquí 
y estoy muy decepcionada, me voy desilusionada porque habíamos esperado hoy una noche de celebridad y lamentablemente no fue así. I'm sorry, can the timer be adjusted? Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I am very disappointed. Um, I am very let down because we expected tonight to be a night where we would get um, the restrictions on UISA removed. Pero no por eso nos vamos a ir muy defraudadas. Vamos a seguir luchando. But not because no of that justo. are we going to leave um, with our, our heads bowed because it is not just. Hay mucha gente latina que está sufriendo ahorita día a día cuánta cosa está pasando y no estamos aquí como para que nos den una decepción total. Estamos aquí también con la frente en alto para seguir luchando y esperemos el apoyo de todos ustedes. I'm sorry, I'm not a professional interpreter, um, but there's, um, I think that you can convey, she's conveying the feeling. Um, she's saying that this is, this is not something that's going to um, have the group be let down and, and walk off. They're going to continue to go forth with this. Um, y lo, lo último que dijo es, que no vamos a irnos con, la, con las cabezas agachadas. We're not going to go uh, with our heads bowed. Estamos aquí para seguir. We are here to continue fighting. Y vamos a seguir. And we will continue. El apoyo de cada and we uno ask de for the support from each and every single one of you. Para poder unirnos y seguir luchando. <coughs> so para that we can las restricciones de la visa be united hoy. and we can uh, get the, the restrictions on visa use resolved. No. Gracias. Thank you. Bueno, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll just say a few words uh, in response. And uh, uh, first of all, maybe I misheard the chief, but my understanding is that the chief said that uh, she, uh, that there were very few cases, if any, that had still not been cleared uh, from any time. But what I will say to you is this. Uh, to all of you all who spoke tonight. I agree with you, and I know that this council agrees with you, that the limitations should be lifted. And uh, I'll be discussing that with the city manager, uh, and I'm sure that uh, he will uh, be in contact with our police department about that. Uh, there's no reason to walk away with your head bowed. You should walk away here with your head held high. Uh, and I can just tell you that you have my commitment to work on this and make this happen. Uh, and it is my understanding that that is also the position of the chief and the department. And so uh, please be in touch with me, I will say, in two weeks. Okay? Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor, can I add something as well? Please do. Um, we have professional interpretation available now as well. and. Um, if you contact us in advance, we can ensure that there are interpreters available, and I'll, I can be in touch with you about getting that information to you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. If, yeah. I, could, if I could just, just as a matter of, of conversation with community, it probably would be best if we actually have someone on site at each meeting just. Thank you for that. I, I, I recognize that, but I think that we're going to we're going to need to get to, to that point. All they have to do is ask in advance, and they'll be here. I think we're going to need to get to that point if we're going to talk about how Latinx communities need to be heard. Recognizing that they, I mean, they might decide to come within ten minutes of the meeting. It shouldn't be a hindrance, and we'll get to that point. It may not be tonight. But. Thank you, Ivan Almonte. Mr. Almonte, welcome. You have three minutes. Please give us your name and address. Um, good evening, my name is Ivana Monte. I live on 311 Salazar Street, Durham, uh, 27705. I'm also here because I'm a victim of a crime, and I was also expecting like my friends to hear about the time restrictions. So, and it's just so disappointing that only two people of the council are talking about how our communities are suffering all these uh, crimes. And in the last few days, there, there was a case of valid arrest. that uh, a Latino was assaulted and he didn't call the police for a reason. So I really encourage you to be connected to the community because we're suffering. We're the ones who live in these neighborhoods where all these crimes are happening. So, um, so I wanna thank you, um, Didriana and Middleton for always talk about this issue because it's, it's really so important for us. We're living the hell every single day. And 
I really think, and the conversation needs to happen soon because my community will not call the police for this. So what we're expecting, what we're waiting for, it's almost a year after the, um, since the uh, shooting happens at Valley Terrace on December 15, and the community feels like no one has done anything to support us. So I hope that a conversation should be taken maybe in one of the neighborhoods with this group because we gotta do something. We are tired of more shootings and helping victims of a crime. It's just like, sometimes you don't, you don't know what to say to our community. Honestly, it just, I mean, they don't have access to healthcare, they don't have access to this and that, so sometimes our lives are miserable. So when we're talking about Donald Trump, Republicans have done other things, but in Durham we're having these policies that is not helping our community. So I hope you can take a different direction and do something. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Victoria Peterson, you have three minutes. Ms. Peterson, you have three minutes. Chief, I'm proud of you, girl. You're doing a good job, okay? When you came here, you walked into a mess, a mess. This city council and the council before this council knew that this community, when it comes to crime, is off the hook. The problem that we have, there are two problems. The citizenry refuses to get up and go out and vote. Less than 50% of the population in this city voted, less than 50. These folks got under 20,000 votes. That's ridiculous. Of a city that is close to 200,000 registered voters. This city council could have given you the funds that you need to patrol this community. Yeah, they have, they are sitting on $42 million. $42 million of taxpayers' monies. The Hispanic community is up here complaining. Hey, I've been in this community for years. We have a reverend that sits up here. He's been trying to do his best. Somebody needs to bring the black folks together in this community and get down here on this council and make these people do what they need to be doing. Supporting this police department, developing programs for our young black men and women to help them get employment, to help them get jobs. To sit up on this council, literally do, literally do, we don't know what to do. Oh. We had two shootings in my community, folks. I live on Ridgeway last night. Our electricity went off from 6 o'clock last night to 3 o'clock in the morning, dealing with Duke Power. So we've got to deal with the crime, also with the electricity. I'm a little concerned about the Hispanic community. You came into a community that is in crisis. I mentioned a year ago, the SBI, ICE, and the military needs to be in this community. When young black men can go up and down these streets, shoot and murder, and nothing is really happening, we have only a little bit, 500 and some police officers, there's no way that these men and women can address the serious crime that is plaguing the city of Durham. No way. This police chief only gave you the part one crime. Numerous times, Mr. Mayor, you've heard me state about the part two and about the juvenile crime. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. We'll now hear from uh, Sandro Mendoza. Welcome, please give us your name and address and you have three minutes. Um, Sandro Mendoza, um, Durham 27707. Um, also, really disappointed about um, what happened today with the U visas six months ago. Even you, Mr. Mayor, said publicly that there was going to be a press conference and all of this. From that time on, 
we told most of our community, we told all community who wasn't qualified to start looking for their paperwork because there was going to be a time where who wasn't qualified, they were going to do it this month. So that's what we've been telling them, just keep doing your paperwork, keep looking for an attorney because they promised us that this was going to happen publicly, online. There's a video out there. The reason why I, the chief doesn't have I sign off mo most on it, but that's the people who qualify. <coughs> she hasn't signed off on people who hasn't qualified. So they were the ones who are going to, are going to sign in when she takes the time restriction off. Uh, I feel like this was all political. Um, they could have done it months ago. Um, yeah, very disappointed. I'm not sure what I'm going to tell the people who I told to start doing their paperwork. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mendoza. All right. Thank you very much for everyone who was here tonight and brought up a lot of serious and important questions. Uh, please be in touch with me about the U visas. Thank you. All right. We'll now move to item 20, the Mutual Plaza Landmark Designation. And uh, we'll first hear the report from staff. Good evening. Um, I'm Carla Rosenberg with the Planning Department. Um, first, I'd like to state for the record that all Planning Department hearing items have been advertised and noticed in accordance with state and local law, and affidavits of all notices are on file in the Planning Department. So I'm here to present a request for landmark designation for Mutual Plaza located at 411 West Chapel Hill Street. The designation requests requested pertains to the two parcels on the northern half of the block, uh, totaling 1.65 acres. This request is submitted by Cynthia De Miranda of MDM Historical Consultants. The Historic Preservation Commission gave its recommendation of six to zero on September 3rd, 2019. And the State Historic Preservation Office issued a letter of recommendation on August 19, 2019. Staff is recommending approval of the request to include the building and land associated with new lots one and two, as shown in attachment three of the staff report. Thank you, Ms. Rosenberg. You've heard the report from staff, and I'm going to declare this public hearing open. And first, I'm going to ask, are there any questions for staff by members of the council? Questions for staff at this point? Just one. Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Freeman. Uh, exactly. So once this landmark is designated, what will, I guess, will, what will come out of this? Will there be an event? Will there be any funding made available? Or is it tied to tax credits? I just want to make sure I'm clear on exactly how this will be beneficial. Sure, so the local landmark designation, um, first of all, gives the property owner the opportunity to apply with the tax department for a 50% deferral on the taxes um, associated with the property. And if both the building and the land are um, designated, then it would be for 50% of the value of the building and of the land. In conjunction with that, um, there would be a new uh, requirement for a certificate of appropriateness um, which applies to all uh, properties within local districts and to all local landmarks. Um, so any changes that would be made to the exterior of the buildings or to the site would require the Certificate of Appropriateness, which is reviewed by uh, the Historic Preservation Commission or in um, cases of less substantial scripts of work by staff. Um, any other sort of ceremonial um, Recognition, that would be separate from the actual ordinances passed and the um, legal requirements. Any other questions for staff? A question, Mr. Mayor. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Um, so it's my understanding that this property is going to be redeveloped, that there are plans to add additional buildings on um, some of the vacant land. How does that affect the historic designation? So a certificate of appropriateness, um, it's, it would be approved under uh, what's called the Historic Properties Local Review Criteria. And so um, there are criteria that specifically address new construction on um, historic sites. 
And so the whatever is proposed would need to meet those criteria. So it would address massing, scale, um, materials used for the new construction. Would those buildings also be um, eligible to apply for the 50% tax reduction? So if the, um, if the land were designated the, and, and the buildings as well for those parcels, then the 50% uh, tax credit would then apply to whatever was constructed on site um, subject to that COA. Okay, and, and the staff and the Historic Preservation Commission are both recommending that we designate the land. Yes, in order to preserve sight lines from the street um, and um, the site itself, um, having some elements that are important to the architecture of the building. Okay, but if but if that property were to be redeveloped, are, are you saying that that helps the, with the redevelopment, we can then control that those elements exactly. are preserved? Okay. That's exactly it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And let me just, uh, just to, the tax benefit currently uh, is about a $137,000 a year, I believe, is the number that you had in the memo. Is that correct? Uh, I would have to come back. Roughly. To that would be the approximate uh, annual tax benefit. Um, the, the th just also, the, the third, there are three parcels, correct? There are three parcels, and we would be recommending new lot one and two. Yes. But not number three, which is half of that. Right. Lot. And so if new lot three was developed, new lot three could be developed, and I'm, I'm going to say this, and you can tell me if I got this right, but new lot three does not have to be developed with those same strictures. That's correct. Right? Yes. And, but, but, and that's really most of the land, most of the vacant land on this property is new lot three. That's correct. correct. And that land, uh, if it's developed, would be not be subject to either the um, requirements of the historic designation, nor would it be subject to the tax relief. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Mayor, just Council Member Freeman. Just one point to note. Um, so, in the same vein as the conversation we had earlier around the cemetery, I just want to note that this historic site has sat um, without designation for at least 30, 40 years now? Um, I mean, it, it was built in the 60s, and we're now in 2019, so. Um, it would have been like 2010 where they would have been eligible. Ah. Uh, right? I'm, I'm eligible for? For historic designation. I mean, we, our landmark program started um, well before that, so. What's the eligibility that you're... So I just want to know if there's any work that's being done in conjunction with the workforce, I mean, well, the Economic Development Department to make sure that there are funds available um, to organizations that are preserving history around black history, specifically recognizing that the mutual um, building itself is a historic landmark. And I know that there's been many occasions where the historic... I guess um, representation has been celebrated and not necessarily has that been quantified into a number. And I think it would be important to make sure that in our legacy conversations, that that is also um, a part of what the planning department is looking at and trying to figure out what we can do. Yeah, that's excellent. Any other comments or questions at this point for staff? All right, we have one speaker signed up on this item uh, and that is Cynthia De Miranda. The author of the uh, this excellent historical review. Here's good. I just signed up in case anyone had any questions, so I have no statement to make. Thank you very much. All right. Is there anyone else? Uh, I, I don't know if I've said this yet. You've heard the report from staff. I'm declaring the public hearing open. I believe I already said that, but just in case I did, just to cover the uh, basis here. Um, you have heard the report from staff. You have heard questions from the council. Uh, you've heard from Ms. De Miranda. Is there anyone else here, this is a public hearing item, that would like to be heard on this item? Is there anyone else here who would like to speak on this item? This is a public hearing. All righty. Uh, if not, uh, I'm going to declare that this public hearing is closed. 
and the matter is back before the council. Mayor. Council member. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, <clears throat> this this uh, building uh, certainly in no way can capture to the full extent all of the hopes and aspirations and dreams that have been attached to it, uh, not just in Durham, uh, but around the world. Um, I just want to, for the record, say I feel very blessed and fortunate to be on the council at this point in history to be able to cast a vote uh, to declare uh, this iconic and sacred space uh, historic and to give it the designation that it so richly deserves. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, I want to just say that uh, we read a lot of policy memos. We read a lot of uh, contracts. We read a lot of recommendations from staff. Uh, and we are really fortunate, uh, I've, I've always felt, uh, in, in city government, in the quality of the writing that we get, in the excellent, um, in the excellent reports, it's also clear. I've, I've always been, been so impressed by that. But it is rare that we get such fabulously interesting reading about our own history uh, in one of our items. This was uh, a great history lesson. I thought I knew a lot about that building. I thought I knew a lot about what uh, uh, what it stood for, and I thought I knew a lot about the history surrounding it, but I learned a ton, and so I want to congratulate uh, Ms. De Miranda and uh, staff, Ms. Rosenberg and others, for putting together uh, such an interesting application. Really, really fun to read. And no offense to our city managers and others, but not all of our items are that much fun to read. <laughs> um, I want to particularly <coughs> cite uh, one page three of the application. Um, let's see if I've got the right attachment here. I'm sorry, page nine of the application. My computer will help me. Yeah, um, I'll just read from it. Uplift and racial pride was still important, of course. In concert with announcing the choice of REA Construction Company of Charlotte to build a new tower, the Mutual also unveiled a training program in the construction trades. Apprentice carpenters, bricklayers, cement masons, painter decorators, and other crafts working on our project under the supervision of journeymen in these trades, that's the end of the quote, would also attend state-supported classes twice a week, announced President Spaulding. The program had the opportunities for raises half yearly. The company intentionally went with a negotiated contract for the work in order to better be able to have input in the hiring of workers, ensuring access to the jobs and training for African Americans. The mutual also was careful to work with architectural and contracting firms that had good record of employing African Americans. Uh, I just want to cite that because, of course, this is the same kind of critically important work now. And we, our bond issue uh, that we have recently passed has funds in it for training workers in these trades, in the building trades. Uh, and I hope that we can uh, not just appreciate this history, but uh, to continue to do this same very, very important work. Uh, and uh, it was inspiring to read this, and I know that uh, we have a duty to continue to do the same things. All right. Um, Just another note on that, Mr. Mayor, if I might. Not quite. Um, I just want to mention again the significant tax relief that com does come with this designation. The tax relief comes with a reason, and the reason for the tax relief is that it's the belief of our the folks that wrote this law, that to preserve a property in its historic condition takes extra money. And the tax relief for these historic properties is associated with that. It is why we have to be careful, though, in terms of the, the landmark designations that we do make. We have to make sure, and through our staff and through the Historic Preservation Commission, that we're judicious about applying this landmark status. Uh, in this case, the, uh, of course, there's no question of the 
incredible historical value. Uh, but I do want to say that it's not just that we give up a ta that we give up taxes, that we give up property taxes. There's a reason that we give up property taxes, and that's to make sure that the historic landmarks can be preserved in the condition that has given them, uh, that has contributed to their historic significance. All right, Councilmember Freeman. You, building on your both points, I would just like to say that um, I appreciate um, how collectively as a community we do come around this recognizing that the disparity has been um, around black and brown communities of in, in building and, and actual people, like in human resources. It's important that we're not only looking at the history, but making sure that we're not um, ensuring extinction. And so when, when you point to the job training and the, and the um, fields that are middle skills, it's, it's an opportunity that I hope that we don't miss in making sure that we surround it, wrap around it, more support. Um, I'm not sure that that's in the bond and the way in which it should be, uh, which is why I continue to press the conversation around what in addition to that we can do. Um, I know that we'll continue to have the conversations. I look forward to figuring out how we move the conversation forward, but recognize that these same deliberations we're taking and looking at history is the same deliberations we need to take in looking at gun violence and the people who are impacted at the center of that being black males. I, I just can't keep, I, can't, I keep harping on it because I know that you know this in your second brain thinking, but first brain you might not. And so, especially for folks at home recognizing that we are spending a lot of time talking about the second brain conversation, not recognizing how all of those stereotypes and all of that, um, all of those lives lost are all of a value to us as a community. And if we don't take care of it now, we'll continue to lose more. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. All righty, uh, I'll now accept an motion uh, that we will need to pass this item. Mr. Mayor, it's Which will be the adopt an ordinance designating Mutual Plaza as a local historic landmark. Council member? Mr. Mayor, it's my uh, honor to move this item. Second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the ordinance designating Mutual Plaza as a local historic landmark. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> we'll now move to item 21, WC and Mary Hinton Lyon House Landmark Designation. Uh, and first we will uh, hear the report from staff and welcome Ms. Rosenberg. Evening again. Um, so I'm now going to present a request for landmark designation for the WC and Mary Hinton Lion House. It's located at 2423 West Club Boulevard um, on a parcel of 0.54 acres. This request again is submitted by Cynthia de Miranda of MDM Historical Consultants. Um, the Historic Preservation Commission gave its recommendation of 6-0 on September 3rd, 2019, and the State Historic Preservation Office issued its letter of recommendation on August 19th, 2019. Staff is re recommending approval of the re request to include the buildings and land associated with this parcel. Thank you very much, Ms. Rosenberg. <clears throat> you have now heard the report from staff. I'm gonna declare this public hearing open. And first I'm gonna ask, are there any questions for staff, for members of the, by members of the council. I do have one question. I know other people that live on Club Boulevard. I might even live on Club Boulevard myself. Um, and there are lots of um, very nice houses on Club Boulevard that have a lot of historical value. They have historic plaques and so forth. Um, and you, I, I, again, I read uh, Ms. De Miranda's descriptions and staff's descriptions, uh, which were very useful, but could you speak to why this house is particu of particular significance compared to, say, other historically uh, valuable uh, houses on Club Boulevard? Why would this house 
uh, be distinguished for this historic designation? Sure. Um, so there were two two points. One, um, those architectural significance of, of it being this uh, prairie style on two levels, um, the mayor style. Um, but even more importantly, we felt uh, was the resident of the house um, having um, the been served on the city council for um, several decades um, and at the point at which um, Durham was expanding the most rapidly um, in its history in the 20s and 30s. And so um, this was uh, a very prominent citizen um, who started off um, humbly and grew uh, to have owned multiple businesses um, that really served this community um, and its growth throughout the early part of the century. Did you say that both of those things would have to be present? Uh, uh, the historic significance uh, of the, well, the building might be in itself historically significant in some unique way. Um, I, I'm, you know, hypothetically, let's suppose, we've, we've had other city council members that have served for lengthy periods of time, poor souls. Uh, and, but they might not live in a house that had any particular historic value. Architectural value. Say again? Architectural, Architectural value. value, thank you. Mm -hmm. Right? So both of these things are present here and they're both important? Correct. I would okay. Say, yes. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so we have two speakers signed up for this item, and I'm going to first call Cynthia De Miranda. So again, I'm just here to answer questions if anyone has any questions about the report itself. Did you agree with Ms. Rosenberg's comments about why this was a particularly historically important house? I think what's interesting um, about Lyon was his, his business at the time, as um, Ms. Rosenberg said, of Durham's rapid expansion in the, 19, um, the late teens and the 1920s. He owned a hardware store. It sold not just hardware, but building certain types of building supplies. And his house was one of the earliest mm -hmm. houses on Club Boulevard. If you look at a map of the neighborhood, it's kind of an anchor position in the neighborhood. And I think his construction of that house, very large, very imposing, an unusual and eclectic style, um, paired with the fact that he owned businesses that related to the building trades, really together those two, the interplay of those two things, um, you know, the house, I think it was also advertised early on in the, in the Durham paper. I think it helped spur development, this kind of suburban development generally, but also particularly in the Watts Hillendale neighborhood. And um, I think his choice of an eclectic architectural style was interesting. And um, in terms of the architecture itself, it's an unusual example. I think the report goes into the fact that there's a similar but different house in Trinity Park. But other than that, this is not a style that was often employed in Durham. So I think the rarity of the style, the prominence of the businessman, the early um, construction of the house and the influence it had on the development of the neighborhood. I think all those things come together for its importance. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Mayor. Uh, let me get the other speaker and then I'll, yeah. The second speaker is Ellen Chompy. Ms. Chompy, welcome. Colleagues, I'm just gonna have Ms. Chompy speak from this microphone right here. Thank you, we're glad you're here. Thank you. Um, also, as Ms. Miranda, I would, as the homeowner, I wanted to make sure I was here in case you all had any questions to let you know there's a real face behind this. Um, and to, I wanted to quote, there's a, a, um, a very high-end watch company that always has these advertisements that say, you never really own this watch. You sort of caretake it for the next generation. And I feel that this applies to our house. Um, it is a privilege and a responsibility to be the owners of such a historically significant and 
labor intensive piece of property. It is a wonderful house. We've had great parties. We are happy to open our home to the community for many things and have during the 20 plus years that we've lived there. But it takes a lot of attention and we don't want, my husband and I, he could not be here, he's ill, but we don't want this care and love and attention when the time comes for us to sell our house. We don't want that to be taken away by someone who perhaps might not have the same feelings. We would like them to be aware of the um, significance and to have the ability and the, um, the love to carry the, the heritage of the house on to future generations and future inhabitants of both the house and the community. And I think that this designation will be a big help in ensuring that. Thank you, Ms. Chompy. Thank you. Councilmember Freeman? I, I uh, am uh, like completely like <laughs> trying to get my thoughts together on I, I really appreciate having, I, I didn't catch your name, I'm sorry. So you're the owner's name again? Ms. Chompy. Ms. Chompy uh, here today. I understand uh, what it is to be a uh, monitor of a older home and I appreciate the work that you're doing. I just wanted to come back to the first speaker was. Ms. D. Miranda. Ms. D. Miranda. And just um, because I opened up this can of worms, it would be irresponsible of me not to ask. Is, do you know the ethnicity or the heritage, heritage, the heritage background of the owner of this property? The original owner. Yes. I can, I'm quite certain that he was white. Okay. And I, I, well, I we only, have seen a, photo, a black and white photo of him, right? Yes. So just noting that um, as a person of color, it's, it's denoted each and every time, whether you're African American and is not, when you're white, it will be helpful that if in your history and noting your history, it will be helpful to have that, that denoted as well. Because what tends to happen is you get, um, folks will see all of the check marks under African American and not under white, and it looks a little skewed. And I think that's not the case, so. I understand. Just that point. Yeah. And um, I wanted to also thank you for pulling together the history. It's really um, great to hear and to read, well, to read through um, just what um, lived here in Durham before we were ever even thought of. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Is there anyone else who would like to be heard on this item? This is a public hearing item. Is there anyone else here tonight who would like to be heard on this item? If not, I'm going to declare this public. I see a hand, hearing. Mr. Mayor. I'm sorry. I, I, I think I see a hand in the back. Would you like to be heard on this item? Um, I have a question. Then please come to the podium. Welcome. Hi. Please give us your name and address, and you have three minutes. Leticia Ross, 1708 Hillcrest Drive, Apartment D, Durham, North Carolina. It's my first time excited, but not really. <coughs> I just had a quick question about, um, I guess, the role of the person that owned the home on the city council. I mean, it's great that they did serve for that period of time, but is there any, I guess, historical significance to what they contributed during that time, um, specifically to the community of Durham as a whole, that it would be significant, that it would now be a historical landmark? Thank you. It's a great question. Ms. De Miranda. Yes, thank you for asking that question. Um, there, there was some research done on that point um, by the homeowner, and um, it's my feeling that he is more significant as a business owner rather than his time on the council. Um, I. I from the, from the research that I looked at, I didn't see anything that stood out that he um, took a particular leadership role in, in um, doing any particular thing. That's not to say it didn't happen, but um, we just, we didn't find that. And maybe Ms. Chompy would like to comment because she 
she did um, a fair amount of research, I believe, in council minutes from the period. But I, I felt that he was important as a local business owner. He started with a harness shop, and it grew to a very large hardware business, paint store. He eventually had a filling station, and um, it seems to me that his larger contribution to the development of Durham was as a business owner and not so much as a city council member. Thank you, Mr. Miranda. Ms. Rosenberg, did you want to also comment at all? I'll just say, um, as noted in this staff report, um, he was outspoken advocate for recreational facilities, parks, um, and playgrounds, and he supported the creation of Durham's first and only African-American city cemetery, um, Beechwood Cemetery, in 1926. He supported citizens in their fight to maintain the trolley system alive during the arrival of bus transit, and he was a founding and sustaining member of Watt Street Baptist Church. Thank you. Ma'am, thank you for your question. Uh, before you leave today, if you wouldn't mind coming to this table and just so the clerk will have a record of your name for the minutes. Thank you. All right. Uh, Ms. Plessy, we want to comment? Thank you, yes. My name's Ellen Pless. I live at 706 East Forest Hills Boulevard. I'll just keep this very quick. Something that struck me as I was listening to Ms. Chompy speak is the fact that we've got a resident who has been living in this historic house for an extended period of time already without tax benefit. They, I presume, have been supporting the house, keeping it up to a level where it actually meets the criteria to still qualify at this point in time for the landmark designation. Um, because this is a resident who has been incurring those expenses already over a long period of time, there's the sense, I don't feel like they're looking for a tax break. I get the feeling that they are truly earnest in terms of forward-looking stewardship to help Durham retain uh, part of its historic structure and, um, and feel. And to that end, I just, as a fellow citizen and a fellow resident of an old house that like our family members, when they get old, we love them. They've got character and they've got a lot of health problems. Um, I totally wish to support her in, in putting that forward and just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pless. Is there anyone else here who would like to be heard on this item? This is a public hearing item. If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. We would need a motion to adopt an ordinance designating the WC and Mary Hinton Lion House as a local historic landmark. So, I actually had a question, if you don't mind. Um, let, hang on one second. Sure. Uh, is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded, and now we'll hear some discussion. Councilmember Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Your, your earlier comment about the, and I'm paraphrasing, the need to be judicious in uh, handing out these designations um, is, is, is paramount. Um, and that's ringing in my head. And, and first off, uh, you talked about the uh, writing on mutual being interesting. This is also equally, uh, equally fascinating history story. Mr. Lyon obviously was a remarkable uh, man and led a remarkable life. And, and I'm sure the house is a grand and beautiful house. I guess my question is, and I, I think, um, uh, first off, Ms. Chiampi, I, I, I uh, wish uh, your husband well uh, in a recuperation, quick recuperation. Um, I, I, um, I think I heard say that there's a similar house in another area, uh, similar to it, maybe not exactly, but there's, there's another house like it in our city. I guess my question, and perhaps you can help me, is, is because some of these things seem to be more art than science. I mean, that, you know, what's the equation to say, okay, this definitely um, meets historical landmark designation. Mutual Tower, for me, obviously clears the, the hurdle uh, a number of ways. I guess for me, if I'm, a, if I'm a visitor to Durham and I'm riding past this house with uh, someone who's conversing on Durham history, you point at the house and say what to me? Because if it's not the only one like it in the city, and yes, this was a very wealthy or, or successful businessman who, and I appreciate the... Um, the work with Beechwood, of course, Beechwood was established because they wouldn't let blacks get uh, buried in Maplewood. So, so, um, what, what, what do you say? I know what to say about mutual, but what, what do I point at this house and say? This house is historically designated as a landmark because I know he was successful and great businessman, and the house is indicative of a particular style. Although we have another one like it somewhere else in the city, 
what gets us over that hurdle to, to, to grant this thing that I think the mayor was right in saying that should be done judiciously and sparingly? Ms. De Miranda, would you comment? Um, that's also a good question, and that's, that's what, that's, these are the questions we're asking all the time when we're evaluating these buildings um, for any, any sort of designation. So I mentioned that there is another one in, in Trinity um, Park, but, but that was sort of the point, is that there's two located in the whole city of Durham, whereas I couldn't tell you how many bungalows there are. I couldn't tell you how many Craftsman Four Squares there are. I couldn't tell you how many colonial revival houses there are. I couldn't tell you how many Georgian revival houses there are. There are just so many of all those styles. And even mill housing, I couldn't tell you how many mill houses there are. Additionally, this house is remarkably architecturally intact. It has seen so few changes in its long history. And um, as someone who really loves brutalist architecture, and most people don't love it, but I do love it. I wish we could say the same about Mutual, because that was such a fantastic design. There were reasons why they changed the design, and I think those reasons were really valid. Um, but that building architecturally has a different history and a different story in that it, it needed some changes at a certain point. This house is really remarkably intact, and that's in itself somewhat unusual. Um, so you, your question, if we're driving around Durham and I'm pointing out the house and I'm saying why is that important, I think because it's, it's a house that helped develop that neighborhood and that neighborhood is a National Register Historic District and also a local historic district. So it was an early house, it's in an anchor position in the neighborhood, it was an interesting eclectic architectural style that would have brought people out to the neighborhood to see, oh, there's this new community for white families, for middle class, upper middle class white families, not even all white families. Yes, all of that is true and that's part of the history. Um, but that's, to me, researching this house, that's the story I found associated with the house. I appreciate that. And, and, I, and I appreciate the, the, the primer on the, the architectural uh, singularity of it. Um, I, I guess for mutual, for me, the, you know, it's the architecture, but it's also what happened there. Uh, I, that, that, that combination of, you, you understand what I'm saying? That's, that's, that's sort of my point. Despite the changes to the mm -hmm. architecture, that building is still, I agree with you, so obviously eligible to be a local landmark. And um, actually eligible, to, in my opinion, to be listed in the National Register of Historic Places as well. And it was intentionally, you know, the leadership of Mutual intentionally built an iconic building. As you read in the report, they hired an architect who specialized in building icons, literally icons. Um, so that was their goal and that was what they wanted to do and that, that was the, what they achieved. And so what I'm saying is despite the fact that some of what was architecturally iconic and, and an engineering marvel, even though, even though that's, those elements have been changed, that did not diminish its significance. Thank you, Ms. Miranda. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Uh, and uh, I'll just say, Ms. Miranda, you said that you found the reasons for the changes at Mutual understandable. The way I read it was you found them understandable, but you weren't too happy about them, mm -hmm. I think would be a more accurate statement. Um, If you want to take a minute to talk about it, I think it's actually very fascinating. So there was um, apparently a, a little bit of a conflict. Between, only, only 30 seconds. Only 30 seconds. There was a conflict between the original engineering company who designed the building and who designed the engineering and the engineering company that they hired in whatever it was, the late 70s, to determine, is this building still safe? So obviously the original engineer said, sure still safe, it's fine. And the other company said, yeah, we don't know. And this was an insurance company after all. They couldn't really risk the building failing, could they? Yeah. <laughs> so it, it did sort of feel like an impossible decision to, to leave it. There was one solution for retrofitting it, but it was insanely expensive, and this was the 1970s, so it just didn't really work out for the architecture of this building. 
Thank you. And Mr. Mayor, before you, before you walk away, I just had just a one clarifying point. I just want to make sure that we're stating it clearly because it sounded like you were saying that because the residential location was fully intact, it was the only reason that it's, yeah. I just want to make sure that it's clear that yeah, if that it is restored, it also could qualify because there are homes that might not, not have necessarily been intact once a homeowner came in and decided to have it designated historic, but it could be restored completely to the period and that would still qualify it. It could absolutely be restored. It also, like the mutual building, could be designated historic despite its architectural integrity because it has a different story to it. So each of these properties have their own individual story and they're gonna have their own individual reason for being eligible as a landmark. Which is why the art aspect of it is exactly. important. Exactly, yes. I'll now accept a motion. Do we already have a motion on the yes, floor? Yes, do. An ordinance designating the WC and Mary Hinton Lion House as local historic landmark. Madam Clerk, you please open the vote. Please close the vote. The motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much. Thank you Byer, for our historic preservation staff for being here. And Ms. Chompy, thank you for being here. We'll now move to item 22, the zoning map change for Bethpage office. This is a public hearing matter. And uh, first we'll hear the report from staff. Welcome, Ms. Struthers. Good evening, I'm Emily Struthers with the planning department. I will now present case A180009 and Z180033. Requests for a zoning map change and future land use map amendment have been received from Charlie Yokely of McAdams on behalf of Rob Griffin for two parcels of land totaling 23.66 acres. The properties are located at 5621 Chin Page and 3824 Page Road. The applicant proposes to change the zoning from Industrial Light IL to Office and Institutional OI. There is no development plan proposed with this request. The property is currently designated Industrial and Recreation Open Space on the future land use map. The applicant has requested a future land use map amendment to Office and Recreation Open Space to coincide with the rezoning request. The Durham Planning Commission at their September 9th, 2019 meeting recommended approval of the proposed by a vote of 10 to two. With regards to staff's recommendation, staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Three motions are required for this application. The first is to adopt a resolution amending the future land use map. The second is to adopt a consistency statement, and the third is for the zoning ordinance. Staff is available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Struthers. You have now heard the report from staff, and I'm gonna declare this public hearing open. And first, I'm gonna ask, are there any questions for staff by members of the council? Seeing none, I'm going to Next, ask, uh, look, next uh, ask for our speakers. We have one speaker to sign up for this item, Mr. Neil Ghosh. Welcome, Mr. Ghosh. Mr. Ghosh, I'm gonna give you three minutes, and if it turns out more is necessary later, we'll work that out. That sounds fine. Good evening, Mayor Shul, Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, and members of the City Council. I'm Neil Ghosh, an attorney at the Morning Star Law Group at 112 West Main Street, and I am representing Tri Properties for this rezoning. Also here tonight are Mr. Rob Griffin, who's the Vice President of Development for Tri Properties, and Mr. Charlie Yokely, who's the land planner for this project from McAdams. Um, this is my first time addressing the council since the election, so I wanted to take a moment to congratulate the mayor and Councilwoman Johnson and Councilman Reese on their re-election, and especially Councilwoman Caballero for her first time election uh, to, to the city council. It's a uh, well-deserved congratulations. Thank you, sir. Uh, a little bit about the project. I'm sure you all are familiar with the Beth Page area, which was approved originally in 2006. <coughs> it had multiple development pods scattered throughout the acreage. The property in this case is within an industrial uh, pod, but it contains both, uh, well, it contains some steep slopes, some jurisdictional streams, and has some access issues, which have proven unattractive for industrial development at least during the more than a decade that my client has owned the property and marketed it for development for either industrial or office space. My client primarily is an office developer, and unfortunately for it, um, in this part of Durham, the market has been slow to respond to the availability of acreage available for uh, development for office. 
Instead, what we have seen nearby is the development of residential communities. So this rezoning represents a, a, a downzoning because we're getting rid of the industrial entitlement and ex basically exchanging it for a residential entitlement while retaining the office entitlement that, th that is there today. Uh, with the residential development both north and east of the acreage, we felt an industrial use really wouldn't make sense and that a residential use would make more sense now than it did maybe previously. And when we met with the neighbors, they agreed. I handed up an email uh, in support from Kevin Walls, who is the HOA president of the adjacent Creekside neighborhood. Uh, if his name sounds familiar, it's because he won the neighbor spotlight in, uh, in April. And so we are honored to have his support and that of the community. We also have the support of the Planning Commission, which recommended approval by a vote of 10 to 2. And my understanding is that the primary concern for the two voted against the project was a lack of a development plan. But we wanted to maintain maximum flexibility through the requested zoning. And we've been very transparent with the neighbors about what a development under this requested zoning might entail. And in turn, we have won their support, and we hope to have yours as well. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. And as I said, we have some folks from our team available to answer your questions, uh, but we are respectfully requesting your approval tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ghosh. This is a public hearing item. Is there anyone else present here who would like to be heard on this item? Is there anyone else who would like to be heard on this item? All right. Um, council members, um, I'm gonna declare well, maybe I'll wait a minute. Any 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 questions uh, and comments first uh, for either staff or the developer by members of the council? Council Member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Mr. Ghosh. Appreciate your remarks earlier. It was an adventure, but here we are. Um, so, uh, Commissioner Al Turk at the Planning Commission um, signaled his concern, expressed his concern about this proposal for two reasons. One, because there's no development plan, as you mentioned. But the other, because um, if we, if, as I heard you say, it's more likely that this is going to be developed as a residential use, why aren't we rezoning as a, as a, as a resident, for a residential purpose? Can you help talk a little bit about that part of it, and then I'll ask you about the other part. Yeah, absolutely. The, we, we've been very transparent about the ability for the property to be developed residentially under the requested district. We've also been uh, very clear that our primary interest, my client's primary interest, is to put an office here. Um, and they have been marketing the property for development for an office for quite some time, over a decade, I think 12 years. And there have been no <coughs> takers. However, if there were a business which wanted to move to Durham and identify this spot, I can guarantee you that my client would be very interested in building them an office on this location. So we do want to maintain that flexibility. And yet, my client has no interest in developing the pro property residentially. However, the writing is somewhat on the wall. It's not been developed in years for office, so it may be more marketable as a residential development. <clears throat> Let's uh, move on to the development plan. I think I heard you say that the absence of a development plan creates more flexibility for your client. Is that correct? Sure. Um, why should that be a concern for the city council? I'm, I'm not suggesting that it should be. I'm just oh, okay. I thought you were. Okay. It's something that is true uh, in this case. That they are maintaining the flexibility through a general use zoning, which, of course, is something that is allowed in, under the UDO. Uh, the lack of a development plan. So I, I can appreciate the um, level of specificity that a development plan might afford in this process, but there are certain aspects about this project that, that give us some certainty even without one. For example, as I mentioned, this is a down zoning. So any development on this uh, property pursuant to the rezoning we're requesting, it, at its most intense level is going, to be, is going to create less traffic, for example, than what you could build at the most intense level in the current zoning. So from a, from a traffic standpoint, we have some level of comfort that what we're asking for is less intense than what currently is allowed. Uh, the other, I mean, I've mentioned this a couple times that, that my client Tri Properties is primarily an office developer. The, there's no builder in mind, residential or office. Well, if it's office, it'll be Tri Properties, but there's no residential builder in mind. 
So I understand that a development plan would generally give one the opportunity to have commitments related to that residential development. We just don't know what that would be. So it's kind of hard to make some of those uh, some of those commitments at this time. Didn't really seem uh, like the right time to do it. Now, of course, all of this would be when it comes to be developed. There will be a site plan, which I understand is not a public process, but there would be the opportunity for the architectural review and uh, and if necessary, a, a traffic study at the time of site plan, if that's necessary. But we don't think it will be. Well, I have to say that was I'm not an expert. That was probably the best answer you've got on that, so I appreciate it. <laughs> sure enough. I'm not sure what I think of it, but I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, I have a question for staff. And it's along these same lines. Um, this is a large parcel. Would we normally expect a development plan with this sort of request, and does the lack of the development plan give you any concerns? Good evening, Pat Young with the Planning Department. Uh, thank you for your question, Mr. Mayor. I, I think staff's position is that development plans are reserved for situations where the um, adopted Unified Development Ordinance standards appear to be inadequate to protect the um, quite enjoyment, property values, environmental features, or other some other uh, interest of the zoning ordinance on adjacent properties. I think as you heard from the applicant's agent, in this case, since um, this is a down zoning, so it's almost less intense in every way, uh, the uh, homeowner association supported it as compatible. We didn't see anything on the site uh, when we matched up against our 500 plus pages of Unified Development Ordinance standards that we thought would threaten or, or jeopardize, um, create undue impacts on the adjoining or nearby properties. So that was, that was our assessment. Certainly we all understand that neighbors um, prefer to have more certainty rather than less, and, and that's very understandable, but we didn't see that there was uh, a significant risk of any uh, negative impacts uh, on the community. Thank you, Mr. Young. Are there any other questions or comments for either staff or the applicant? A question for staff. Mm -hmm. Specifically around the, I guess the open space, the recreational open space. Um, I know that we're getting ready to enter into a comprehensive plan process or at the very beginning of it. How does this impact or how do you frame the future land use map against where we, where that area is going with all of that residential? Is there enough open space identified in this? So the future land use map um, identifies recreation open space, uh, primarily in areas such as uh, floodway, floodplain. Um, and so what you see um, designated as uh, recreation open space is directly tied to those environmental features. Um, I can't speak for the uh, comprehensive plan future, um, but that's what we are working with currently. Can you explain like what the measure looks like, how the measure is made in, or even in the old 2005 plan? what the measure was to determine whether there was recreational open space in this area. Sure, I'll just, Pat Young with the Planning Department, I'll just expand on Ms. Struthers' answer. Um, as Ms. Struthers said, the only property we designated as open space and recreational are properties that were owned in, uh, by a public entity uh, in, in recreational use or that really were precluded from any other substantial use like floodplain areas. So just to expand on what Ms. Struthers said. But, but that doesn't, but, in addition to that designation, um, all of our different development uh, zones, including the one that's before you tonight, uh, do require so some open space um, dedication um, on site. Uh, Mr. There's going to give me the exact amount for the OI proposed I OI use. So it's 18 percent of the gross area of the site. So even though that's not designated on the future land use map, that isn't ordinance requirement um, at the time of site plan, it will be applied and we'll ensure that 18% of the gross acreage of the site, which is more than it is for industrial. So it would be significant increase over the current conditions. And just noting that, that 18% is specific. It's not just like anywhere on, on that section. It, well, it's 18%. Um, there, there's um, limitations and requirements about wh where it can be, but uh, there's some discretion to the applicant and some requirements about where it has to be on the site. 
um, but it has, does have to be committed on the site plan. And just noting that it will be committed in the site plan, how do you, uh, like, how do you feel comfortable with it in, I guess, pre-site plan, noting that there's such a large, it's like a U, so, so to speak, around it. Is there a floodplain in there, or am I missing, like, am I missing a, that there's a creek? Like, there's something that's <laughs> cautioning us right now with the open space designation. Well, there, there definitely is floodplain on the site, um, and, and stream buffers, which um, can be used in part for open space. I don't think the applicant wants to elaborate on that, but um, there are areas that um, can be claimed for open space that will be protected and preserved. Um, I'm not sure I'm getting at your question. <laughs> no, and I'm, I'm just really just trying to gather some some feedback so that I can make a determination based on what you're saying. Sure. Because I'm, what I'm also going to get, what I'm also looking at is that in current situations where we're, we have housing or office space in a floodplain, who's responsible for alleviating that flooding? Well, the intent of the, of the standard is to keep the floodplain as floodplain, have it be undeveloped, and therefore not have any um, additional impact than what it does prior to development. That in combination with our stormwater standards. Um, if the property is developed as residential, um, which I believe is likely, but it certainly it's being marketed for both office and uh, residential if this is approved, um, there has to be what's called active open space, so that means it would be um, outside of a floodplain area and managed as some kind of a recreational or active, like a walking trail or a sports field. So I, I don't know exactly what that percentage is. So one third, similar. one third of that. So over one third of eighteen is six percent. And that looks similar to like a Duke Diet the Fitness active open space. Is what you're saying? It could. I, I, I mean, don't not that per exactly, se, but I mean, right. there's like there's some features around it. It has to be right and active. So sports fields tracks, um, tennis courts, walking trails, running trails. Okay. And then just going back to the responsibility as, as far as, I know that the stormwater feature or the stormwater um, standards were in place 92 and forward or so. So for office institutional, office industrial, office light, what was it, oh, it's, it's OI. Right, yeah. For OI prior to 92, Who's responsible for alleviating the flooding? Well, if the, if a property was developed prior to the current stormwater control standards, um, and they and the use is not um, changed or abandoned, then they're not the owner is not required to mitigate or manage the stormwater. Uh, so, typically, what would happen is that those downstream impacts are managed by the city or wherever the impacts occur. And, I'm, and I think I'm bringing to light, I'm not saying that in this case that it would be something that would pre prevent me from moving forward, but I want to make sure that we're mindful of the fact that, I, as a council colleague has mentioned, that climate change is a factor. And recognizing that flooding is going to occur more rapidly and more intensely in a lot of areas. If we already have a feeling or an understanding of where those areas are, we need to be even more intentional about not building densely in those areas. And then also, I, I don't know how we create some in our unified unified development ordinances, space that acknowledges that particular point, so that we're not trying to ding a developer in each case, sure. so that there's enough Duke Diet Fitness features around an area that we know could be flooding, without a site plan to know whether or not they would be building into that area or not, and that might make it a little bit easier to. Even if you just propose. I'll, I'll try to, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'll, I'll try to react to that if I might. Um, so there's two separate issues that are definitely inter, interrelated, which is stormwater management for quality and quantity and, and floodplain. Uh, floodplain is federally, is a condition of get, uh, flood insurance for our residents, is uh, federally mandated. Um, again, if we want to sell, allow our residents to get flood insurance, which of course we do. Um, one of the things Durham does, which is very innovative and a very small number of jurisdictions in North Carolina do, is identify both current and future 100-year floodplain. I think there's an item later that's going to talk a little bit more about that. So that is already identified and regulated, uh, and I, 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 the amount of what can be the encroachments in those areas is very, very limited. Uh, and if it is um, 
sought. There's additional approvals required, and there's also a do a documentation required that what's called a no-rise, meaning the flooding levels won't rise. So on stormwater, again, this is, since this would be new development, they have to meet all the current stormwater development standards on the site. So I, th I think in this instance, it's, it's very well covered through those two means. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Any other comments, or uh, Councilmember Milton? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so while, while the absence uh, of a development plan certainly in no way automatically scuttles a, uh, a rezoning request, it does, at least for me, invite a different level of scrutiny or perhaps a different type of scrutiny. So I, you know, I look to the staff uh, to give us assurances about protecting <coughs> the quality of life of residents. Um, and I also look to what the people say. And, and I appreciate the letter from Mr. Walls in which he says, I quote, is 110 percent. I'm not the best math student, but 110 percent, 110 percent, 110 percent support from the residents. So I'm curious, how many how many meetings did did they have out there about this? Do you know? We had, I think we had two meetings, and and just just to be clear, I mean, to touch on the item, I think Councilman Reese asked, you know, why should the city care that the developer wants more flexibility? And I didn't mean to suggest that that's what we're asking for here. It is, I and mean, we are asking for more flexibility, but the point is, uh, when we were rezoning, there was two options, theoretically, presented, one with the development plan and one without. And what we decided to do was to be very open and honest with the neighbors. And what we found, actually, was that the neighbors in this case, they, they, when they bought their properties, they understood that they were buying uh, homes next to a non-residential a zoning district. But what they didn't understand or appreciate necessarily was that industrial uses could be established on that acreage. So we went w through with the neighbors the list of uses that are allowed in the district we are requesting and compared that to the list of uses that are allowed under the current zoning. And the neighbors at that time agreed that what we were asking for was more in line with what they originally uh, understood to be the case uh, about the types of uses that could be established on the property next to them. So these are not neighbors that only want to see residential. In fact, they would invite and always had assumed that there would be non-residential next to them. But they do not want industrial uses next to them. And that, I think, is the main reason why we were able to uh, work with them and get their support. Um, and, that, and I will say, in lieu of a development plan, which may have given them a, a, a distinct level of specificity about what was going to be built there. The truth is, we don't know what's going to be built there. That's why we didn't do a development plan. But what we decided to do instead was tell them everything that could be built there and see if they had concerns about that. And, and we found out that actually they really like our request. Just so I'm clear, so you said two meetings? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, thank you. We would need a motion to adopt this. Uh, uh, first of all, though, I guess I need to close this public hearing. Is there anyone else that needs, wants to be heard on this? Anyone else here that wants to be heard on this public hearing item? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed. The matter's back before the council, and uh, I would accept a motion to adopt a resolution amending the future land use map. Mr. Mayor, if I could, before we adopt, uh -huh. I just want to ask staff if it might be possible. I'm just trying to figure out to the point that Councilmember Middleton made, um, if there's a max form and how it would fit into this section, not necessarily like a development plan, if there's a way to see like max form and that's in that area, even if it's just a box, what it would look like sitting in that section just to make sure that I'm, I, I mean, I just don't feel comfortable with both stormwater and flooding being possible areas of concerns because we're basing it off of 2005. And so I'm just trying to just trying to make sure that I'm not missing anything. Now I'm fine to vote no and move forward, but I would really like to find out if it's possible to like wait a moment and to see if there's a, a way to see this and feel a little bit more comfortable about it. So are you asking the question of um, how much can we build on there um, by ordinance standards? Um, so for, uh, if it were to be built out as office um, or under the OI zoning, non-residential, um, I believe it's 60% of the area can have building on it. Um, that 
doesn't take into account um, the streams or the floodplain. Those are other constraints that they would need to uh, respect. Could, is it possible to see a, a demonstration or a graphic that would reflect that? I don't have one. Um, I'm not sure if the uh, applicant or their, their site um, planner does. Wouldn't Do you have any Mr. graphics showing percentages of potential? We have any, I don't think we have any graphics, but I was, I was uh, just conferring with Mr. Yokely, who is at McAdams, and uh, the overall site is about 23 acres, and a, a, a portion of it, you know the portion that's about floodplain? Yeah, so about four, four acres are in the uh, stream buffers or uh, floodplains, and the way that realistically this site would be developed uh, would be, at, I would say, at a max of, of 300, 300,000 square feet of office um, without, Im and that and that is specifically so that you don't impact the, the uh, stream buffers or floodplains. If you were to develop the site at the max residential, uh, you'd be upwards of 250, yeah, 220, 220 residential units, and so in that scenario, You'd have, you'd have to have at least two points of access per the UDO, and so at least one of those points of access would require a stream crossing. So at the max end uh, of the residential development, that's where you would get the most environmental impact, but you could develop the site for, um, I guess, 100, uh, 100 unit residential units and not have a stream crossing, and that would be, uh, that would be uh, less impactful on the environment. And if you developed it for solely as office, you, you could do up to 300,000 square feet and you wouldn't have to impact any floodplain or have a stream crossing at all. Uh, the, the site kind of, the I guess the highest point of the site is kind of in the middle of the site, if that makes any sense. So that's probably where most of your development will go. Thank you, Mr. Ghosh. Can I ask, um, on the, if there's a max of 220 units, that could be possible. What would it look like on student impact on that on the side of the county? Yeah, those and those numbers are in the uh, staff report. I think it was uh, well, I shouldn't guess, but I think it was like thirty three students total. So I'm pulling up attachment eight um, in order to answer your question. Um, so based off of the um, let's see, if it were to be used. Um, with the maximum number of residential impact of um, calculate out as 253 multiplex units, which is 11 units per acre, um, we see an impact of proposed zoning um, totaling, let's see, 54 students additional compared to the um, non-residential use. Mm -hmm. Any more questions, council member? I'm good, thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Struthers. Any more questions? Yep. This public hearing is closed. The matter is before the council, and I'll accept a motion to adopt a resolution amending the future land use map. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second that we adopt a resolution amending the future land use map for low medium density residential for the site. Madam Clerk. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Now that we've had the motion and seconded the motion, I'd like to make a brief set of remarks before Absolutely, we vote. Absolutely, Mr. Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Colleagues, as I think you might have been able to tell from my questioning of Mr. Ghosh, I'm loath to support this item. Uh, Mr. Ghosh, I gave you a little bit of a hard time. You were fantastic. I, you've done, you've been, you've dealt with us with candor. You've been direct. You've been forthcoming. I really appreciate that. Honestly, it was fantastic. Um, the idea that we would approve this without a development plan, purely because it gives the owner more flexibility to either develop it under the use that they prefer, or to sell it to a residential developer who will develop it under the max fill current zoning, or future zoning, is a difficult pill to swallow. Um, I want to associate, my, associate myself completely with Commissioner Al Turk and uh, Commissioner Baker's uh, remarks about how much I don't like that. <laughs> And ultimately, my likes or dislikes don't matter. How about what a bad idea that is for the way that we handle our business uh, on these types of issues? At the same time, um, the mayor of Creekside sent us an email in which he said that, as Councilmember Milton pointed out, 110% of the residents of this neighborhood, I'm assuming they're 
including like grandparents who come to visit their kids and folks, kids off of college who come back for the holidays. I mean, I'm, I'm going to give them some play on the 10%. I think that's fine. Um, support this rezoning. And it's easy to see why. You offered them a very unattractive list of uses under the current zoning and a less unattractive list of uses under the future zone. <laughs> um, and I think ultimately, uh, uh, while I do share the concerns about how this makes less possible meaningful community engagement on the backside, like once this thing actually starts to be developed and whatever use case it gets done, that this type of process that, that I'm about to vote in favor of um, robs those future residents of that opportunity. But the current residents have said this is what they want. And while I can have a lot of theoretical reasons about why they shouldn't want that, um, because I'm wicked smart and know a lot of things, the fact is that is what they want. And in this situation, it's not the worst case option. Um, and I don't like voting for it. I'm loath to support it, but I will be voting yes, Mr. Mayor. That's all I have to say about that. Thank you, Councilmember Reese. Okay, I'll try again. Uh, we need a motion to adopt a resolution amending the future land use map to low, medium density residential for the summer. It's moved and seconded. We just got to open the vote. Is it, uh, Councilmember Caballero, is there a second? Yeah. Second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The motion passes 6 0. We need now a motion to adopt a consistency statement. So moved. Second. second. Moved and seconded that we adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. And finally, need a motion to adopt an ordinance amending. Motion the, passes 6 0. I'm sorry, Madam Clerk. To adopt an ordinance amending the Durham Unified Development Ordinance. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded that we adopt the ordinance amending the Durham UDO. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. And please close the vote. The motion passes 6 0. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Ghosh. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. Thank you all for being here. I will now move to item 23, United Development Ordinance Text Amendment, Federal Emergency Management Agency FEMA Firm Updates. And we're here with Mr. Stock. Welcome, Mr. Stock. Thank you. Uh, Michael Stock with the Planning Department. Uh, text Amendment TC-1903 is a technical update to adopt revised flood insurance rate map or firm panels issued by the Federal Emergency Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, uh, by December 6, 2019, as required by FEMA and state law, in order to maintain Durham's participation in National Flood Insurance Program, or NFIP. Uh, the NFIP requires local communities, as a condition of future federal financial assistance and federally backed property in flood insurance, to participate in the flood insurance program to adopt floodplain ordinances consistent with federal standards to reduce or avoid future flood losses. FEMA implements the FM. And FIP and the North Carolina Division of Emergency Management serves as a state coordinator. Uh, once FEMA approves floodplain map for the NFIP, uh, each local government affected by floodplain uh, must incorporate the revised map into its floodplain ordinance, and no new flood insurance coverage can be provided until that occurs. Um, the panels that you're looking at tonight are actually all in the unincorporated part of the county, and that's why I went to the Board of Commissioners back in um, October 28th for their approval. Um, uh, they are actually a follow-up uh, number of panels. This board, um, as the uh, Board of Commissioners back in October of 2018, saw a larger list of panels. These were leftover panels, uh, parts of the map that were under con that were con being contested in neighboring jurisdictions. Some of these panels cross jurisdiction, Person County, uh, Granville County. Uh, the Joint City County Planning Committee reviewed the text amendment and had no concerns. The Planning Commission recommended approval 12 to 0, and as I mentioned before, the Board of Commissioners have already approved the amendments at its October 28th meeting. Um, as a reminder, City Council will require to take two actions. The first would be the action on the appropriate statement of consistency that's found in Attachment A, and the second would be action on the ordinance amendment itself, which is Attachment B. Uh, thank you. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Stock. You have heard the report from staff. I'm going to declare this public hearing open. We do have one speaker who signed up to speak on this item, and that's Ellen Pless. Ms. Pless?
Welcome, Ms. Pless. Please give us your name and address, and you have three minutes. Thank you. Yes, uh, my name's Ellen Pless. I live at 706 East Forest Hills Boulevard in an area that floods very regularly. We are frequently featured on the news, um, people breaking out boats and fishing rods in order to <coughs> participate in fun in our backyards. Uh, as Durham incentivizes new construction, it simultaneously increases our flood risk. Living in a residential area that is defined by its pressured urban forest surrounding a FEMA flood zone has been an education. That forest is incredibly important to us. It includes old growth trees and many others. The FEMA firm update, while I understand you may need, frankly, to pass this in order for my neighbors to, consider, to continue to be able to get their flood insurance, uh, this does provide an opportunity for this body to please consider the development of actions that might mitigate the expanding flood risks that come with every single <laughs> approval of building that, you, that comes before this body. Such actions could include more robust urban forest protections, better infrastructure for stormwater, specifically around our areas that are flooding actively, and to quote Councilmember Freeman in the Beth Page item just prior to this, quote, we need to be more intentional about not developing too densely in the areas around floodplains. I could not agree more thoroughly. My neighborhood has initiated actions that would assist in such mitigations, an NPO application and a separate action to amend the future land use map. I ask for your support moving forward as Forest Hills tries to manage its expanding risks with regard to flooding. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you, Ms. Pless. All right. Uh, is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? This is a public hearing item. Is there anyone else that would like to be heard? Are there any questions or comments by members of the council? Any questions or comments by members of the council? Just a note that I want to uh, echo. Miss Marion Pless. Pless's comments, and that it's it's becoming it's wearing on me to see how much of where we're missing because we're still in 2005 ordinances. So hmm. holding steady, but thank you. <laughs> Any other comments by members of the council? Any other questions or comments by members of the council? Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed. The matter is back before the council. Uh, we would need to adopt first motion one, the appropriate consistency statement. So moved. Second. Second. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The motion passes 6-0. And we would now need a motion to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. <coughs> Second. Been moved and second that we adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. The motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to item 24, the United Development Ordinance Text Amendment, Omnibus Changes 13. Um, I'll just say that this is my ninth time hearing this presentation over the years. And if you've not heard previously the omnibus text amendment, you really haven't enjoyed yourself fully. This is one of my favorites. <laughs> and I, I want to thank Mike Stock for his usual diligent work. And let me just say that you all have heard of Woodstock. I now call this item Mike Stock. And I believe we ought to celebrate accordingly. All right. I, I joined I'm not Mr. quite Mayor. sure how to respond to that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I will let, let it. I'll let it. All where it lay. Much appreciated. <laughs> uh, Mr. Stock, welcome. Uh, we would like to hear the staff report, please. Absolutely. Uh, Michael Stock with the Planning Department. Um, text Amendment 1901 consists of uh, technical revisions and minor policy changes to various provisions of the Unified Development Ordinance. Amendments are identified as necessary corrections, clarifications, reorganization, or other minor changes to clarify the intent of the regulations or codify interpretations of regulations or reflect uh, as aforementioned um, minor policy changes, uh, some of which are not solely technical in nature. Uh, additional amendments are proposed specific to a number of UDO provisions, including uh, comprehensive uh, plan and evaluation assessment report, or the EAR, uh, limited agricultural permits, and domestic chickens. 
um, sedimentation erosion control regulations, uh, accessory solar installations, and expanded sidewalk placement. Uh, Joint City County Planning Committee reviewed the text amendment and had no concerns. The Planning Commission recommended approval 12 to 0 at its September 10th meeting. Um, again, as a reminder, the City Council will be required to take two actions. First would be an action on the appropriate statement of consistency found in Attachment A, and the second would be the action on the Ordinance Amendment itself, Attachment B. Again, I'll thank you, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, you have heard the report from staff. I'm going to declare this public hearing open. We do have two people who have signed up to speak on this item. First is Ms. Ellen Pless, and second is Mimi Kessler. Ms. Mimi Kessler, uh, if you all will please come to the microphone here to my right uh, and uh, welcome. You each have three minutes, and I'll call you first, Ms. Pless. Thank you. I'll try to be less nervous this time around. Ellen Pless, 706 East Forest Hills Boulevard. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Um, I'm interested in addressing three different sections of the text amendment, specifically part one, section 3.2.5, dealing with the notice and public hearings. Durham likes to state that it is committed to equitable engagement. Well, equitable engagement begins with successful notification. The sparse notification requirements written into Omnibus 13 do not adequately support equitable engagement and therefore are not in the best interest of the community. Durhamites cannot engage where they are not successfully notified. Email notification is not sufficiently adequate as it fails to reach anyone who has not signed up in advance with the city's notification system or anyone who lacks consistent, sorry, I'm out of breath and I don't know why, lacks consistent and reliable internet access for whatever reason. Publishing notices in the newspaper of council's choice is also not adequate, as a great number of Durhamites do not read that same paper. Equitable forms of notification are those which are most readily accessed and which notably were missing from the EHC process. Those include mailed paper notices sent to impacted property owners, and large signs posted in publicly affected areas for the benefit of all passers-by. Successful notification is not just notification that is convenient to the planning department or some other version of what is the minimum the state might let us get away with. If we actually are a city for all that is dedicated to equitable engagement, then we must commit to successful notification. The sparse notification standard of Omnibus 13 does not adequately support equitable engagement. Um, the next section is section 17.3, the defined terms. With respect to the definition of density, please do not accept the proposed definition as it appears in Omnibus 13. Instead, please develop a definition in which accessory dwelling units, which fulfill the definition of dwelling unit, are included in density. In other words, an ADU, if it is being used as a dwelling unit, should count toward density. As it is written, ADUs will not count toward density, and no one has been able to defend why that is an appropriate method to proceed with this. Please explain clearly the logic why an accessory dwelling unit, operating as a dwelling unit, does not count toward density. What is the rationale for creating a parallel class of housing comprised of fully functional dwelling units that essentially become invisible on paper when it comes to density. How does creating this invisible class of stealth housing benefit our neighborhoods, our straining infrastructure, and the accuracy of our growth and density-related data? The last issue I wish to touch on real quickly, very quickly, is the suspension of the UDO rules for the planning director. I'm hoping Ms. Kessler might follow up on that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Plass. <coughs> Ms. Kessler, welcome. Please give us your name and address. You have three minutes. Good evening. My name is Mimi Kessler. I live at 1418 Woodland Drive in Durham. And I do want to talk about the um, item number uh, 1.11 um, in the text amendment. Um, my basic problem with this is I don't understand why it's necessary. And my further comments have nothing to do with the incumbent in the planning director position, Mr. Young. It has nothing to do with him. What, what makes the planning director qualified to suspend the UDO? What qualifications does that person have that an elected official does not have? What criteria constitutes an emergency? Some people have told me it's things like 
there's a natural disaster and that there have to be FEMA trailers um, parked someplace that ordinarily the UDO wouldn't allow. Uh, perhaps there's some sort of martial law situation. Um, there's no criteria for removing the emergency situation either. And there's no reference to consultations with elected officials. I would like to know why the paragraph is necessary, and I would much prefer that this decision is made by an elected official as opposed to staff. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kessler. Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? This is a public hearing item. Is there anyone else that would like to be heard? All right. Thank you. Uh, we will now hear if there are any questions or comments by members from the council, members of the council. Sure. Council Member Reese. Can we have staff respond to the concerns that were raised by the residents just now? Mr. Mayor, would that be okay? I'm sorry. I, yes, that would absolutely be okay. Mr. Stock, could you please uh, 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 comment uh, Mr. pursuant to Mr. Reese's questions on those three items? Absolutely. Uh, so the first one talks about notice and public hearings, uh, particularly for UDO text amendments. Um, the current practice um, is publication in the uh, uh, newspaper that is required by state law, and we maintain that practice. Um, the other requirement that we have in the UDO is beyond state law or in addition to state law, which is um, you, um, email notification. Um, originally, just to give a little history about that, before the UDO, there was a policy of, na of neighborhood notification with public hearings, um, zoning amendments, and, and other such. Um, that was codified when the UDO was adopted in 2000, well, became effective in 2006, and then about a, I guess a year or so ago, we took a look at that current process where the neighborhood notification was limited to a certain range and we felt that we were starting to hear a lot more concerns that certain uh, neighborhoods or persons uh, that were uh, registered with the planning department weren't getting notification on certain cases because they were just beyond that notification range, um, whether it was 300 or 600 feet, um, but maybe a neighbor, a neighbor of theirs did get notification or a certain uh, neighborhood didn't get notification because they were just beyond um, a notification range. So um, we had brought the idea to JCCPC and eventually through a text amendment through city council to basically open it up to anybody who wanted to be registered um, with the planning department to get at least once a month, although our notices go out twice a month, um, for all public hearings that are going on with links to those cases. Um, and as far as I'm aware, we have a larger um, list um, for uh, that uh, public service notification than we did for the limited neighborhood notification registration that we had prior to that. Um, so that's to answer that first question. Um, the second one with uh, ADUs, um, historically the interpretation has always been that ADUs have never been counted towards density calculations. Um, density calculations tend to prohibit the uh, use of ADUs, um, and actually we uh, made that explicit with the adoption of the Expanding Housing Choices um, uh, text amendment within the ADU section that it would not be explicitly uh, counted towards uh, density, and this is just a follow-up technical uh, adjustment to the definition of density to make that clear also. Um, and then I think, Pat, you wanted to address the suspension of rules issue. Yeah. So good evening, Pat Young, again with the Planning Department. The provision that Ms. Plus mentioned briefly and Ms. Kessler spoke to, 1.11, um, is intended to um, ensure that we as a community and I as the um, administrative representative are allowed um, with consultation for the administration and the mayor. Um, my, my understanding is it would require, Mike, maybe you can help me with this, the, the mayor's <laughs> authorization. So again, this wouldn't be something that the planning director, myself or any subsequent director would do independently. But if there is a federal or state emergency declared and a federal or state entity wants to come in and say, put an emergency housing um, because there was a widespread damage or destruction to housing, that um, there was a means or method 
uh, for me to authorize the suspension of, of those rules for that housing to be installed. Currently, there's not. And our, we, we've been fortunate here in Durham that we haven't had a, that kind of widespread disaster, but I think we were concerned uh, with several of the disasters over the last couple of years that if there were to be a federal or state entity that with the administration and the mayor's blessing wanted to put in some kind of housing or do some kind of other repairs or development that they wouldn't have to strictly adhere to the UDO if the uh, declaration identified uh, that as a, as a need, if that makes sense. So there's no independent authority for the, myself or any subsequent director to enact, utilize those provisions without a federal or state emergency declaration and um, approval from the administration and from the elected officials. You agree with that, Mr. Stock? You agree with that interpretation? I agree. I would never uh, contradict my my boss in that manner, but well, but he is but he is correct. You, the declaration of emergency good. is is based upon city and county codes, and it would only be that that provision would only be uh, instituted based upon a declaration of emergency based upon those codes. Yeah, thank you. I just I, I didn't mean that you disagree with him. I meant he he asked if you he asked for your. Uh, help there, and I'm just making sure you're giving it. I, did. I, I couldn't remember the specific role of the, the mayor in this, but Mike, as, as ever, has reminded me that it, that's embedded in city code, and so that's where that comes from. Thank you. All right. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Council Member Reese. I'll just speak to that real quickly. Um, um, it's my understanding that uh, the authority that would be vested in the planning director pursuant to this amendment applies only to a situation in which um, the mayor and or the chair of the county commissioner has declared a state of emergency pursuant to city to the city the relevant city ordinance. The relevant city ordinance has uh, reference to state statute, which lists the various categories of reasons <coughs> why an emergency declaration might be appropriate. Um, uh, Ms. Pless, and um, you can find that at North Carolina General Statutes 166A-19.3. It's the definition section of the North Carolina Emergency Management Act. Um, and um, the, I would just ask the city attorney uh, kind of how that would work on the back end. That was one of the, fo one of the folks that spoke, I believe it was Ms. Kessler, who asked um, if, the, if, the, if the UDO, this ordinance gives the, the planning director the authority to suspend any portion of the ordinance or to, to cease enforcement of any portion of the ordinance and that authorization is, that authority to do so is triggered by the declaration of emergency. Um, what happens if the mayor and or the, the chair of the county commission determines that the emergency is no longer in effect and revokes their declaration? What happens to the, to the planning director's authority under that situation? I am speculating, Councilman Reese, and I would have to research it specifically, but I, was, I would suspect if the emergency declaration has been rescinded, that we would go back to the prior state of affairs. And pursuant to what I'm saying, I'm sure some kind of orderly wind down of like if we had some temporary housing built in a place that Correct. didn't allow for that, we'd have to wind it down, right. And um, I'll also just say as a comment, not as a question to the folks who raised this concern, that this is obviously a very valid issue that you've raised. Um, and it takes some digging into the city code, the city ordinances, find reference to the state law that has a list of all the categories of things that would be a valid emergency. Um, and, but what I'll also say is that the, the question you raise, I think it begs the question, what if we had a rogue planning director who decided they didn't like the UDO and wanted to do differently? Well, the, the, the scenario, the, the, the turn of events that would allow the, that kind of planning director to exert that kind of authority is extremely limited to the very narrow category of emergencies that are listed here, and also a, a subset of those in which the mayor or the chair of the county commission decided to issue a declaration of emergency, and would only persist so long as that authorizing person, uh, by virtue of their position on either of those boards, were to allow the emergency declaration to remain in place and not rescind it. And if we were in a situation in which a planning director persisted in not enforcing the ordinance or deciding to do whatever the heck she or he wanted to do, there is a chain of accountability in the city that ultimately runs up to elected officials to make sure that that did not persist. Um, 
And so very valid concern, incredibly valid concern, especially as it relates to the, the enforcement of really important rules and regulations in the city. And I just wanted you to know that we take that very seriously. I appreciate that. No, Ms. Kessler, I'm sorry. Is there anyone else that has any comments or questions? Any members of the council? Councilman Mills. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, with respect to um, <clears throat> the um, equitable notification, uh, which is something that, that resonates with me deeply, um, I, this is my second time uh, looking at the hearing the omnibus uh, presentation. Uh, I, and, and I'm sure I'll be corrected if I'm wrong, I don't see the 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 listing of of ways to notify residents or citizens as exhaustive. Um, in other words, it doesn't preclude us from doing other things as well that we might find necessary. And, and the codifying our minimal targets or what we do doesn't mean that we can't do other things to to notify uh, folk um, in in the in between times. In the meantime, so so. I resonate, and I hear that all the time about uh, how folk, you know, didn't know and don't hear. Um, and I think that um, I think that we have the, the, the approving this these omnibus changes does not lock us or, or, or preclude us from doing those things above and beyond what's codified here and listed. At least that's my my reading. This is not. And uh, the city attorney can speak to that if, if, if I'm wrong about that. But I think we need to always be vigilant about um, uh, exhausting all the ways, all of the tools that we have uh, to notify people, to be as creative and as, as exhaustive and as, as um, diligent about um, notifying folk um, when something's going on in their neighborhood or in their community. So I just wanted to, to put that out there that I, I don't see this list as preventing me from doing other things or calling for other things to be done to notify folk. Uh, that's it for me, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Any other comments, Council Member Freeman? Just on the accessory dwelling unit, I think I missed something in the comments that Ms. Pless was making because I'm. I just want to make sure I'm clear that we're not talking about the the coop as accessory dwelling unit for the chickens versus accessory dwelling unit for the person. And I just want to make sure that I'm catching what you're saying. If you could just come back up. And say the, 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 part, the small part that you said about uh, defined terms being invisible on paper or something, because I'd want the coops to be invisible on paper. They're not units that people live in, but I wouldn't want the units that people live in to be invisible on paper. Well, correct, yeah, and, and forgive me if I got loose in my speech. I was referring specifically to section 3.2.5. So we are dealing with accessory dwelling units in this case, that are probably not coops. Um, okay. I was specifying accessory dwelling units that are being used as dwelling units. One could foresee that an ADU might be built for like an art studio um, or some other purpose, uh, a wood shop, you know, something where you've built the structure but no one is residing within the structure. Um, but in a case where we do have somebody residing in a structure and using it as a, as a dwelling unit, and it meets all the definitions of dwelling unit, which I believe occurs in that section 3.2.5. Why is it not counting toward density? And I, I, I hear it's that historically there's an argument that that's what's messing it hasn't been, but that's, again, I'm getting at why are we not? It's not, well, we've never done it before, but what is the rationale behind having that then become invisible when we're talking about density in Durham? Sorry, did that answer? I, I think so, but it's not section 3.2.5. That's what oh. I'm me up. But, uh, but oh, if staff could help me out here. I'm just trying to make sure I'm clear. We are counting the dwelling units that people live in as density? No. For regulatory purposes, no. They are not, they, would not, they do not count as density. They have not been prior to expanding housing choices. Um, they was explicitly put into the regulations through expanding housing choices. And this, this is just a technical clarification of the definition for density that covers that, plus other aspects um, within the ordinance that might affect density calculations. Can you specify which, which section that is? Because it's not 3.2.5. I'm sorry. Oh, um, so, well, the um, definitions is uh, section 17.3, defined terms. Yeah. Okay, I'm so sorry. Uh, and then also noting that 
Now, if it's not included in density for regulatory purposes, how does that impact setting up a program that would provide for nonprofit organizations to increase density with accessory dwelling units? Wouldn't affect it at all. It, it's a program that would exist in and of itself. Um, it actually makes it easier to do that kind of program when you don't have to worry about density. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Plants. Thank you, Council Member. Any other comments or questions by members of the Council? I do have a couple of comments. Um, first of all, I, I, at home, I have a folder in which is the what I might have to sign uh, in case of an emergency. I also keep one at the office, and I've had to sign them before. And I have a lot of faith in our staff in terms of uh, talking to me about that, getting me well prepared for it, um, and am not concerned that that will be a problem. I appreciate your uh, thinking about it, but I, I have so much uh, faith in our staff, and I know that uh, the safeguards are completely there and feel 100%, or I guess tonight I would feel 110% <laughs> level of comfort. Um, on the, I also appreciate the speakers raising the issues of the notifications, notification and density um, I think that uh, Mr. Stock spoke well about uh, the, the ADUs, uh, and we have, we have previously discussed this uh, while we were discussing the EHC. We were very conscious of what we were doing there, and I think that <coughs> this is just a recodification of that and feels very appropriate. Uh, on the notification, I appreciate Councilmember Middleton's comments. We can if there are times when we need to do more, and certainly we are doing a lot more in a lot of our, uh, in a lot of the work that we're doing, uh, lots of different kinds of notifications. I would just think about what we did. Uh, well, we have a, an item coming up. Uh, 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 by, at the end of this meeting, uh, where there was just an enormous level of notification of all sorts where that was uh, deemed necessary. And I think that the standards that we have built in here are appropriate. Okay, um, any other comments or questions by members of the council? Just one more. Uh huh. So in tracking the accessory dwelling units um, in light of EAC that would come up in a historic district, how would you note that specifically in, I guess, a case that came forward? I, I guess it would come to the Board of Adjustment rather than the planning commission, like how does that move? I'm, I'm trying to put, wrap my mind around what it looks like to see this come forward and to assess whether or not to support or not support because it is in a historic district based on a, a lack of density or increase in density. So, so local historic districts um, focus on the design and oftentimes also placement, mass scaling and all, and materials. So not focusing on the use. Okay. The use uh, the use and development of an ADU has its own regulations in addition to what would be required under the local historic district, which would have to go to the Historic Preservation Commission. And that would be tracked how? That would, it would be a certificate of uh, appropriateness issued for that. And it would be tracked also through building permits um, th when they go for building permits for an accessory dwelling unit and also kept on file. Mm -hmm. One, one last addition to that, if I might, Pat Young, we, uh, with the Planning Department, as we promised you as part of the EHC proceedings in September, we're going to come back uh, and do a very detailed report to you all on, on all of the um, development that's implemented uh, at the six-month interval um, at uh, Councilmember Middleton's recommendation. So I think that's February or March. Mr. Thank Payne. you. Councilmember Reese? I had something else to say. Um, I, think, I didn't want to let the moment pass without noting that section 12.4.2, the sidewalk requirement, has been changed dramatically outside the urban or outside the downtown uh, compact neighborhood, uh, downtown tier, uh, to require new development to have uh, sidewalks on both sides of the street, uh, outside of freeways and expressways, of course, um, which I believe one of our planning commissioners, Commissioner Baker, uh, called a revolutionary change in our UDO and something he was really excited about, and I am too. Uh, and with that, I'm ready to move on. Thank you, Councilmember Reese. Uh, one more. Um, 
the planning commissioner Baker also says that this talks about the city's goal of reducing community emissions by 30% by 2030. I'll quote him. The additional walkability and sustainability provisions related to block lengths, connectivity, green building, and design are fundamental to achieving these outcomes and should be carried out immediately. So I'm trying to remember the last time we did something immediately. Um, but um, uh, Mr. Young, <coughs> talk about the timetable for considering concerns like these. Are all of them wrapped up in the COP plan? Are there any that should be considered on an accelerated timetable? Sure. So, Mr. Mayor, it's a very good question. As you've heard me say before, I think the concerns that Commissioner Baker and other planning commissioners have raised um, are very valid and worth a due consideration. We, we did exactly the kind of assessment and analysis I think you expect us to do, and the only one um, that he and other commissioners had raised that we felt like we could take forward immediately was the one that's before you tonight that um, Councilmember Reese referred to about requiring sidewalks on both sides of the street in the suburban tier, and that is a significant enhancement. I appreciate Councilmember Baker's um, description of it in the way he did, because it is a, um, a really a best practice and something we probably should have done a long time ago, but here we are. The other items he's referred to, such as um, much lower uh, required block lengths, we, like we have in our um, compact design districts, things like um, required green building standards, kind of have a whole host of um, fiscal legal and policy issues that are complex and that involve costs and trade-offs and that really need uh, a more analysis. And our commitment has been uh, and remains that to do that through the comprehensive plan process. But again, I think it would be either uh, at, towards the end of the comprehensive plan process in early 2022 or during the comprehensive plan process if we can accelerate um, community engagement and research on, on some of those independently. Thank you so much. All righty, any other questions or comments on item 24? Just to say that I have also been here about six times now and I am always amazed at how staff tries to gather all of the <laughs> possibilities around how from 2005 to now that we can manage to have some, some continuity in what we're approving and not approving. And I still, I still feel uh, tension there, but around the environmental side of it, but I'm, I'm confident that the staff has made every possible um, push to, to make sure to ensure that we have um, the regulations in place to, to support um, the city and how we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Any other comments? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and I'm going to ask that uh, there be a motion to adopt the appropriate consistency statement. So moved. Second. We moved and second that we adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. The motion passes 6 0. And uh, the motion to adopt an ordinance amending the Unified Development Ordinance. So moved. Second. Uh, Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. The motion passes 6 0. Thank you very much. Another year of Mike stock is under our belts. <laughs> I, I think next year, I, can we have some tie-dye maybe or uh, something like that? A lot more where that came from. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, new mount, now move to item 25, zoning map, map change for Chalk Level Road. Uh, and uh, we'll hear from Ms. Sunyak. Welcome, Ms. Sunyak. Good evening. Good evening, I'm Jamie Sunyak with the Planning Department. A request for a zoning map change has been received from Stewart Inc. for one parcel of land located at 1107 Chalk Level Road, totaling 12.17 acres. The applicant has applied for a zoning map change from Rural Suburban 10 to Rural Suburban Multifamily with an associated development plan that stipulates up to 97 townhouse units. The area is designated low medium density residential on the future land use map, which coincides with this zoning request. Key commitments include limiting the development to townhouses as the permitted building type, limiting the building height to 35 feet, limiting the number of units to 97. Um, entrance number two will be a public access and serve a maximum of 10 units. A minimum of 80% of the townhouse units will have habitable square footage that will not exceed 1,500 square feet. 
and installing a bus pullout and um, uh, pad bus shelter on the south side of Chalk Level Road adjacent to the site. Additionally, the applicant has agreed to construct a sidewalk within the Chalk Level Road right of way along the frontage of um, PID uh, 126012 and 126011 prior to the issuance of the first certificate of occupancy. The Durham Planning Commission recommended approval of the proposed by a vote of 11 to 0 at their September 10th, uh, 2019 meeting. Staff recommends um, that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Two motions are required for this application. The first is to adopt a consistency statement, and the second is for the zoning ordinance. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Ms. Sonyak. You've heard the report from staff. I'm now going to declare this public hearing open, and I'm first going to ask if there are any questions by members of the council for staff. Just one. Will the new tax commitments be applied to this case immediately? I'm just, I'm just messing with you. It's late. I'm <laughs> like I said, nothing immediately. <laughs> okay. Um, Mr. Mayor, I, I, just want to add, I just want to mention to staff how much I appreciate providing both sets of comments from the planning commissioners. It was extraordinarily helpful for context. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Uh, we have one person signed up to speak on this item, Mike Tarrant. Mr. Tarrant, welcome. You have three minutes. If you need more than that, uh, we can talk about it. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor Shul and members of the City Council. My name, again, is Mike Tarrant. I'm with Stewart. I uh, reside at 4616 Paces Ferry Drive. I um, have been helping Eagle Point Properties with the case that's before you this evening. I have Mr. Keith Greenwood with Eagle Point and some members of his, of his team if you have any specific questions for them. I'd like to thank staff for their report. I think they did a good good job summarizing um, our objectives with this project. There are just a few things I'd like to reiterate and just touch on briefly, if, if I may. Um, we did have two neighborhood meetings for this project leading up to this point. Uh, those did result in many of the commitments that you see um, that were presented to you just now, um, including reducing the number of units from 192 to 97 um, and changing the, um, the unit program from apartments for rent to townhomes for sale. Um, so part of the strategy with re, um, minimizing, or excuse me, putting the, the cap on the 1,500 square feet for the units was to help assist with the affordability of these units by keeping the, the sales price down. Um, and then the, the cul-de-sac, or the connection to the um, neighborhood to the west um, was introduced in an effort to reduce the amount of traffic going through the neighborhoods. Uh, again, these were all things we worked through with, with the neighborhood um, to uh, get, get their consensus with this project. Um, the additional sidewalk that uh, Ms. Sonyak mentioned is um, between our frontage, so we were committing to construct more sidewalk than what would be required under the ordinance uh, so that there won't be a gap in, uh, in that portion of Chalk Level Road. Um, as Ms. Sonyak mentioned, Planning Commission did approve this by uh, unanimously, 11-0. Uh, um, and we feel that this project as a townhome development will provide a nice transition between the apartment community to the east, to the single family um, neighborhood to the west. <coughs> so with, with those factors, uh, we would greatly appreciate your consideration of this request and your support with it. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Tarrant. This is a public hearing. Is there anyone else here that would like to be heard on this item? Is there anyone else here that would like to be heard on this item? I'll now ask council members, are there questions uh, or comments for the applicant? Uh, council member Caballero. Uh, very quickly, I just wanted to thank you all for um, doing a lot of engagement in that neighborhood. I know that it was um, different than, uh, your, your plan was different at first and um, and that can be challenging. So I appreciate the continued effort there. And I also appreciate the, uh, from BFAC's comments around the sidewalk gap that you all are planning on not creating that. So again, appreciate that. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Question, Mr. Mayor. Council Member Middleton and Thank then Madam Mayor Pro Tem. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. What are the price points on the townhomes? I think low, low 200s. Low 200s? Were there, did you have any, were, uh, or your client had any discussions about um, 
any proffers to our affordable housing fund or to Durham Public Schools? Were there any discussions about that? We haven't made um, uh, significant efforts in, in those conversations at this point, given the, given the change in the development program and the other uh, commitments that we're, we're making at this point. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I really like this project. I appreciate your commitment to um, keeping the units as affordable as possible. I want to bring up um, some of the conversations that I had with the developer prior to this meeting, where the developer indicated that their initial conception of the plan was using our affordable housing density bonus um, and building more units than are currently in this plan. Um, though I do like this plan and I'm going to support it, I wanna point out that I think the original plan was better and through conversations with the surrounding neighborhoods, that plan was changed um, to have less units, less density, and for the units to be for sale and less affordable. Um, we are going to have to deal with conflicts that come up with building affordable housing near existing single family residential developments. And one of the comments that we heard from the developer was that some of the residents explicitly stated they didn't want affordable housing near them. And that is why they requested for um, the plan to be changed. Everyone in Durham is gonna need to have affordable housing near them. We need more affordable housing in our community. That's a fact of of growth and of how Durham is developing. And so we can't, we can't not build affordable housing because there are people in our community who don't want it near them. We're going to have to figure out how to make affordable housing available throughout the city. Um, we have not had a lot of success with our affordable housing density bonus. And I would really have loved to see a project um, that used that bonus and provided some housing that would have been affordable to people at lower income levels. This is not, this is a problem that happens in every community. Um, there are lots, there's lots of reticence to building additional housing, denser housing, and especially affordable housing. It's something that we as a community are going to have to face and are going to have to address because we need more affordable housing in Durham. Um, <coughs> and we need it to be in all of our neighborhoods, not concentrated in certain neighborhoods where people think it belongs. So I just wanted to bring that up for the council to consider and also uh, would like our planning commissioners um, to think a little bit more about how we move forward um, with adding more affordable housing to our community. And thank you again for your proposal and happy to support it. Thank you. Other comments? I would also like to align myself with um, Mayor Pro Tem's comments in recognizing that it is a need it's important that we are looking at where um, where the conversation is going um, at a neighborhood level, which is why I've been pushing for us to have more engagement at the neighborhood level, because if we don't have the conversations, people don't necessarily understand, and we don't want forced, you know, um, affordable housing. It's important that the, that the community feels integrated into the conversation in a way that makes it, makes it so that they're neighbors. And I, I really do appreciate the process that you took in having the meetings and actually stepping down so that there isn't a tension for the new people, new residents moving into these housing, into this housing and in a way that we've seen in some of the other contentious conversations. But I know that there's a process we'll have to go through to figure out how to move um, forward with some of the conversations. And, and I, I mean, I hear it in many communities where people say, I don't want those people to live near me and it's just not acceptable. And it's important to make sure that we note that for everyone in Durham, that that is not gonna work. We have to do better and we have to figure out how to make this work at a, at a neighborhood level so that everyone feels comfortable in, the, in the, um, moving us forward affordably and equitably, sustainably. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Any other comments or questions? I do have a comment. Um, I'm also going to vote for this. I also appreciate the engagement uh, with the neighborhood. Uh, we on the council, uh, as well as our planning commission, often delay decisions on zoning matters to ask developers to go back and work more closely with the surrounding communities. And that is very often an important step and sometimes, often, results in better zoning plans and decisions. But I will say in this case, 
uh, while the negotiations uh, apparently pleased the neighbors and the planning commissioners. And I understand that the developer can live with this program, uh, the current program just fine. I also <laughs> think that the negotiations, well, negotiations apparently also stopped the very first use of the city's affordable housing density bonus. So I'm voting for this rezoning, but I am not at all sure that this is the best outcome for our community given what the options were. Uh, and I hope that our planning commissioners, I will urge them, uh, as Mayor Pro Tem Johnson mentioned, to think hard about these issues before sending developers and neighbors back together to negotiate. What's good for one neighborhood, and this is a hard thing to hear, but true, isn't always what's best for the people of Durham as a whole. And I'm worried that in this case, that is what has happened. Uh, that we've gotten something that's more satisfying to the neighbors, that the developer can live with and can prosper from, uh, or wouldn't be proposing this and developing it. Uh, but I, I think that it's, uh, it, this is not the best result for the city of Durham. Uh, we could have had a better result, and uh, especially if we could have used the density bonus. So this is not really directed to you at all, Mr. Tarrant, but really to more to our community, to our planning commissions, and to those of us on the council to think about how we're going to deal with these issues. All right, any other comments or questions from members of the council? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed, and the matter is now back before the council. We would need a motion to adopt a consistency statement. So moved. Second. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. The motion passes 6-0. We would need next a motion to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. The motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Tarrant. <clears throat> we'll now move to item 26, FY 2025 Consolidated Plan Needs Public Hearing. And I bet you Ms. Conyers is here. Ms. Conyers, welcome. I don't have a, I've heard you just as many times as Mr. Stock, but I'm, I'm, I'm still working on a name. <laughs> good to see you. It's good to be seen. Um, good evening, Mayor Shule and members of council, Wilma Conyers, Department of Community Development. Um, this is a public hearing to receive citizen comments on community development block grant known as CDBG, Home Investment Partnership known as HOME, Emergency Solutions Grant, known as ESG, and Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS, known as HOPLA, how funds can be used over the next five years to address housing and community development needs in Durham. Notice of this meeting was properly advertised in the Herald Sun, the KPASA newspaper, and the Carolina Times. As a recipient of CDBG, Home, ESG, and HOPLA funds, the city is required to hold at least two public hearings prior to the submission of the consolidated plan and annual action plan. We anticipate the second public hearing will take place in March or April of 2020. In addition, the city is required to publish a copy of the draft consolidated plan annual action plan at least 30 days prior to submission to HUD. The five-year consolidated plan and annual action plan must be submitted to the Department of Housing and, Housing and Urban Development by May 15th or as applicable to HUD. HUD has not yet announced the <clears throat> FY 2021 entitlement al allocations. However, for planning purposes, we expect to receive 1.9 million in CDBG funds 1 million in home funds, 160,000 in ESG funds, and 429,000 in HOPLA funds. A summary of these comments from this public hearing will be incorporated into the consolidated plan slash annual action plan. No action is required by council to receive public comments on the needs public hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Conyers. You've heard the report from staff. I'm going to now declare this public hearing open. 
Um, is there anyone here to speak on this item? Ms. Peterson, welcome. You have three minutes. I think this is a good time um, for the city. And Ms. Freeman, you're in my ward. She's in charge of my ward, even though I'm speaking to all of the city council persons. This is a good time to really look at to see how these dollars are going to be used. Um, Ms. Freeman, since the city has signed off on this $95 million bond, this is a good time to try to work these federal dollars with this bond that also has been approved. Because we're speaking about two separate, two separate dollars. And here's an opportunity. Um, persons speak about making sure that the young men are being trained. Whoever is going to be getting the monies for their various projects, we need to make sure that they're going to be hiring our local men and women uh, to help them to get employment, whatever these projects. And I'll, I, will get, I would like to get a copy of this to be able to go back over to see exactly how the monies are going to be used. I think in the past, the city will allow organizations, nonprofits, to put in applications for these funds. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't have it here in front of me. Uh, how that is going to be done this time. But I'm glad. I hope the city council will sign off on it. Uh, but we've got to have some folks who are really going to manage and oversee these dollars to make sure somehow that they're going to be able to work with that $95 Because now remember now, folks, we're out here on this campaign trail stating about how this $95 million is going to be used, we're going to hold this council accountable on how those dollars are going to be used. And any other dollars here in the city, because the city, as I've stated before, has about $42 million sitting in their reserve. We need to get some of that, Pastor Milton, for job training. Get some of that monies, open up a good training program in the Holton School. And when this city starts remodeling, the housing, and the senior citizens, we will have young men and women who are already being trained in carpentry and construction. Stop waiting for these companies to do it. We have the money. This city has the money. Mr. Schuler, you're the mayor. You're in charge. You are the visionary for this community also. you got to step up to the plate. Put the $5 million out there. Bring in a, a individual, several, that can run a construction program over in our Holton School, and let's get with it. Let's stop dragging our feet, trying to figure out what to do. We have plenty of people. Pastor Milton, he's a minister in this community. He knows other ministers that could come to the table <coughs> and help this city address this serious problem that we have have with our young folks caught up in this system. And these dollars, that's the purpose of these dollars coming in from the federal government, to make sure that our local people are getting employment and we're helping the needs of the community. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. You're welcome. Anyone else like to be heard on this item? If not, I'm gonna declare this public hearing closed. I don't believe any action is necessary. Is that correct, Ms. Conyers? Thank you so much. We'll now move to item 27. It's also a public hearing item, the Urban Avenue Street Closing and Development Agreement. Good evening, Pat Young with the Planning Department. Uh, with me tonight are representatives from the General Services Department, uh, Gina Probst, Stacy Poston, and Matt Filter, as along with Emily Struthers. Um, this item before you, as the mayor indicated, is a, st a street closing request and an associated development agreement. The property at 949 Washington Street, um, the Brame Specialty Company building, um, there's a proposal to redevelop the property that requires uh, both of these actions to proceed forward. 
However, this afternoon we received notification from the um, applicant that there was a change to the um, required easement, which would involve a change in both the development agreement and the uh, street closing plat, which necessitates a continuance uh, or, or some other deferral of this item. Staff is recommending a continuance to the uh, December 16th, <coughs> if I have that date correct, um, uh, hearing, well, two cycles hence, All right. uh, to, to consider this item and we'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. We would ask that if you choose to take that recommendation that you open the, open the public hearing. hearing. Okay, yeah, thank you. You have heard the report from staff. I'm gonna declare this public hearing open. And without objection, we will continue this public hearing until December the 16th. Right. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Biker. Thank you all for being here. We'll now move to item 33. Madam, uh, Ms. Peterson, uh, welcome. You have three minutes. Mr. Mayor, can you please uh, tell me? Um, Mr. Ms. Peterson, your time has started already, uh, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Ms. Peterson, go ahead. Yes. Can you please uh, tell me who's going to be in charge of this group here? Uh, when are they going to have their meetings? Ms. Peterson, if you will go ahead and make all of your comments. And okay, if you have any fine. questions, and if I do think okay. there are ones that we can and all should answer, I will. All righty. Uh, I would like to know who's in charge. Um, when are they having their meetings? Uh, do you know about how many meetings they have had already? Uh, it looks like when I look on this, can you please tell me what OF means? Uh, I'm assuming BF must mean um, black female. Um, we are actually African Americans, females, if that's what BF means. Uh, I'd like someone to tell me what is H slash LF, H slash LM, and H slash LU. I, I just have a little concern, Mr. Mayor, also. Uh, I think the organization needs to be a little bit more racially diverse. Uh, I don't, from this, uh, I really don't see any whites on this organization. Uh, I don't see any African-American males um, that's going to be part of this organization. I know we want to reach out to the Hispanic community, but I think we're going to send a bad message if we're trying to tell other folks they are not welcome part of this organization. So they don't have to be, I'm assuming, um, Mr. Schuler, that they don't have to be a member of this organization, but it would be nice to know when this organization is going to be meeting, uh, also to get a copy of the bylaws. And also, those persons who are going to be in leadership of the organization, you've got to make sure that they really are citizens and that they are also naturalized. Because that's going to be very, very important. And the reason why is because we do not want to send a wrong message in this community that it's okay to be part of a whole lot of stuff and they are not legal. Even though we want to help a lot of people, and I understand that because I'm a Christian, and I understand that people are coming here from other countries in serious, in serious conditions, but we've got to make sure that if they're going to be part of these organizations and they're going to be in leadership, and that's what I'm speaking here, those persons that are going to be in leadership, we've got to make sure, if we can, if we can, that they are... U.S. citizens, and that they are also naturalized. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. Ms. Peterson, uh, go ahead and take your seat, and then I'll have a couple comments. Okay, so I hope that, that you will be able Ms. Peterson, if you'll take your seat, I have some comments. Let me just tell you my first comment. Let's make this absolutely crystal clear. Grace, Grace. Everybody is welcome in Durham, regardless of their documentation status. And that includes they are welcome on all of our city boards and commissions. And we have an explicit process by which people who do not want to reveal their documentation status are not required to do so. We would never require that. We are not going to require that for this commission or any other commission. And I hope I make myself crystal clear. 
To answer some of your questions, uh, there are bylaws. Are there bylaws already for this group, <coughs> Madam Clerk? Those are public, in, it's a public document. If you would like a copy of those bylaws, you can go by the clerk's office and they can be provided to you. Um, the, uh, the meetings will be noticed in the way that all of our commission and board meetings are noticed. If you will just look at the county, uh, this, the city clerk's page, you will be able to find that. Um, the, the designations that you asked about, OF means other female, means they're not either uh, Hispanic, black, or white. They identified themselves that way. HLM means his Hispanic or Latino, male or female. I believe that answers all your questions. There being no other information, there being no other items to come before this body, I'm going to declare Mr. this. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, I'll move the appointments on item. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Is there a motion second. for the appointments? I made it. Moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Mr. Mayor. Yes. If I might. Just, yes, of course. I just want to make sure that it's clear. I know from the work session that there were some changes in the votes. And I think we did head nods rather than hand raises or roll call. And I just want to make sure that the clerk has noted all of that in the meeting minutes or what have you. I also want to note that it does raise concern um, to have a full um, committee under the mayor where there is only Hispanic and black. And so I just want to make sure that we're noting that that is the case based on equitable uh, or racial equity in, in a stance that this is a people of color kind of thing. And it's important to note that that's a positive, not a negative. Thank you, Madam uh, 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 Council Member. We have a motion on the floor to approve these appointments. It's been seconded. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The motion passes 6 0. Thank you. It wasn't my smoothest meeting, but I will now say <laughs> there being no other items to come before this body, we are adjourned at 10 55. You look like banging the